good morning, good afternoon, depending on the part of the world you're at. Welcome to the 2021 American Business Council Cybersecurity Conference. Uh, we're, we're running this conference in conjunction with uh, the um, ministry, Federal Ministry of uh, Communication and Digital Economy, uh, USTDA, as well as uh, fantastic um, private sector partners. My name is Margaret Oledi uh, from the American Business Council. So uh, before I, I go on, I would really like to uh, appreciate the, the, the presence of uh, the uh, Honorable Minister for Communication and Digital Economy, who's always been collaborative, you know, working with us on, on, on a lot of projects. We really appreciate his presence here. We also appreciate the, um, the Ambassador, uh, Excellency, yeah, US Ambassador to Nigeria, uh, uh, Excellency uh, Mary Beth Leonard. And uh, yes, before I, I hand over to the next person, I'd just like to give you some quick uh, tips on how to work on this. So um, for me, this is the first time I'm using this platform as well, which is very interesting. And so to quickly navigate through the platform, you go to your left-hand uh, side, uh, that's the left-hand side of your screen, to see the agenda and the button would say um, live. And this button tells you the session that's currently uh, running. And you also have uh, the the booth or the, the booths you have for our sponsors and partners. I I would um, really like that you visit the booths. They are very very interesting. And so uh, at this point, I would uh, hand over to the the president of the American Business Council, uh, Mr. Dickwall uh, Faulkner. Good afternoon. Um, I think we're about to start. Um, Honorable Minister of Commission and Digital Economy, Dr. Isa Antami, the U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria, Ambassador Mary Beth Leonard, the Chairman, Senate Committee on ICT Cyber Crimes of the National Assembly of Nigeria, Senator Yakubu Oseni, heads of government agencies here present, my esteemed colleagues in the cyberspace, distinguished men. The subject cybersecurity has been one of critical concern since the creation of the internet. The pandemic induced migration passenger the work of to cyberspace has heightened this concern. In Nigeria alone, the number of mobile internet users grew from 68.5 million in 2019, just prior to the pandemic, to 85.26 million in 2020. This increase in internet users almost inevitably brought with it an increase in cybercrime. In the FBI's Internet Crime Report published in 2020, Nigeria ranked 16 on the list of the top 20 international victim countries of cybercrime. This cybersecurity conference for in-depth conversations to address our country's vulnerabilities in the context of heightened cyber attacks and to create coordinated efforts towards addressing them. We have here, here present today representatives of government, the private sector, influencers, civil society, and academia to engage on the subject. In addition to this, the American Business Council has developed local talent to create innovative solutions to cyber security challenges in a cyber hackathon, which commenced on Monday, August 2021. This is an avenue for developing to address some of these challenges and ensure that they work. Panels were conducted on Tuesday, 24th August 2021, and it wouldn't be here today. I thank our partners and sponsors for their support of this conference and hackathon. I encourage you all to participate actively in the discussions that we ensue. Thank you very much uh, the, to the US Ambassador to Nigeria, Mary Beth Leonard, to give the opening remarks. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Honorable ministers and distinguished ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for having me here today. I'd like to take a moment to recognize the organizers of today's event, uh, the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, the American Business Council, and the Ministry of Communications and Digital Economy. We so value the spotlight being put on the crucial topic of cybersecurity. The world's digital transformation induces, introduces such exciting and life-altering technologies to Nigeria, along with the chance to accelerate the economy. These technologies also provide limit, limitless potential to harness the entrepreneurial drive of Nigeria's young population, engaging your most valuable asset and solving the world's biggest issues. 
As more Nigerians become connected to the digital world every day, their livelihoods and local infrastructure become further dependent on a secure cyber environment. The technology that has brought us closer together and supports our neighborhoods can be used against us. And for too long, the world has been reactive to the threat of cybersecurity. We need to be forward leaning and fortifying our cyber defenses and protecting the services on which we rely, setting aggressive and achievable goals in pursuit of a more secure world. Every global challenge we face today, from climate change to physical security to illegal trafficking, is dependent on a secure cyber environment. As we become more interconnected and our world is increasingly digitized, the threat from nefarious actors becomes more disrupt disruptive. Both the United States and Africa have experienced significant cyber attacks on our governments, infrastructure, and private sectors. I cannot overstate the importance of building our cooperative efforts on a firm foundation of international cyber policy, including a widely accepted understanding of what constitutes responsible behavior in cyberspace and shared approaches to hold accountable those who do not act responsibly. The integration of our cyber environment necessitates unity in solutions. International cooperation is crucial in defending a stable, reliable, and interoperable internet for everyone across the globe. Such an infrastructure supports international trade and commerce, strengthens international security, and fosters free expression and innovation. Many represented here today are the most innovative in the world. Their participation is indicative of a readiness to ally with Nigeria in pursuit of more secure digital spaces. The U.S. mission has multiple avenues to facilitate engagement with pioneering American companies. Through the U.S. Trade and Development Agency and the U.S. Commercial Service, government and private sector actors in Nigeria can connect with the world's best technology companies. These companies are immense resources for cap cap capability building in Nigeria and accessing the means to develop the indigenous workforce of the future. I would like to again thank everyone here in attendance today for their attention to this serious matter. Those who wish to safeguard our digital community must match the enthusiasm of those who wish to do it harm. Events like this raise the profile of this issue and increase awareness among our citizens. And therefore, I wish you all fruitful discussions. Thanks so much again for including me. Your security and compliance needs are our business. We're listening taking the time to understand the regulations and requirements that affect you. The goal? Deliver the information you need now. That's why we created AWS Artifact. It's part of our commitment to building a comprehensive compliance portfolio. Artifact is your go-to central resource for compliance-related information that matters to you. Audit reports, workbooks, agreements, and other useful resources. It's all in Artifact. Available on demand so you can evaluate us, getting deep insight to assist in creating your own compliant environment. There's no charge to use Artifact. So if you're subject to certain regulations like HIPAA, you can electronically sign agreements. Or for PCI, download audit reports. Whatever you need, when you need it, you can find it in Artifact. What used to take days now takes minutes. To get started, go to the AWS Management Console and search Artifact. Thank you, Madam Ambassador, for those remarks. Uh, my name is Merritt Baer from the office of the CISO at AWS. And next, I have the pleasure of introducing the keynote speaker, Dr. Issa Ali Pentami, the Minister of Communications and Digital Economy for Nigeria. Dr. Pentami is recognized for his proactive stance in addressing key issues, sector, and growth of the digital economy of Nigeria. It is my pleasure to welcome the Honorable Minister Pentami to give the keynote address on Nigeria's cybersecurity framework. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening. It all depends on from where you join the session. The U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria her Excellency Ambassador Mary Beth Leonard, the CEO and the Executive Secretary of uh, American Business Council, uh, Margaret Olele, other CEOs here present, uh, partners and organizers of this event, uh, participants, uh, all other protocols duly and respectfully observed. 
Uh, I am pleased to deliver this uh, keynote address at the 2021 Cybersecurity Conference organized by the American Business Council. I use the opportunity on behalf of the federal government of Nigeria under the leadership of President Muhammad Buhari to express our appreciation to the U.S. government, American Business Council, American Embassy in Nigeria, the sponsors and the partners of uh, this event, that uh, it came up at the right time to discuss the laws and policies we have in place in Nigeria, the strategies we had been deploying in order to counter cyber attacks and prevent cyber crime to the best of our ability. Uh, the, choose, the choice of the theme, that is 2021 Cyber Conference, uh, Cyber Security Conference, clearly showed to us that uh, cyber security issue is not uh, for few people, but rather everyone's business. Each and every stakeholder has a role to play to ensure that we provide ourselves with a secured cyber space in the country or globally. Furthermore, as we all know, even before COVID-19, uh, the rate of cyber crime was already staggering and was worrisome. The rate has been increased by COVID-19 pandemic because many institutions, many bodies uh, have gone online. And because of this, that automatically increased the rate of uh, cyber crime and cyber attack globally. According to the cyber security ventures, that most probably by 2025, in the next four or five years, the rate of cyber crime, or rather the cost of cyber attack, will reach up to 10.5 trillion USD. And they predicted that because of COVID-19, cyber crime is increasing by 15% from 2020 to date. And the, um, the cost will reach up to 10.5 trillion USD. And they said also, if the cost reaches that amount, it will be almost higher than the third largest economy globally based on gross domestic product. If it reaches 10.5 trillion USD, only two countries will have GDP higher than that, and that is the US and China. But beside them, all other countries will be lower than that. This is to show to us that cyber crime today in the world is not an optional issue to address it, but rather is mandatory because we always go online the day by the day. In addition, the hackathon that preceded this event is also very relevant because based on what I have been briefed with, uh, the hackathon came up with so many initiatives where our young innovators are challenged to come up with indigenous solutions that will address our indigenous challenges in the country. This is indeed highly commendable. And on behalf of the federal government of Nigeria, we also extend our appreciation to the organizers for coming up with this to support the country in identifying the brilliant ones among our citizens. And we are also pleased to inform the organizers that when the best one are identified, federal government of Nigeria is willing to support in any way possible to make their startup or their ideas or their innovation more and more successful. Cyber criminals are very creative, unfortunately. So cyber security experts must also be creative as well so that we will be able to counter their potential dangers. Furthermore, to show to us the dangers of a cyber attack, according to the chief technologist of uh, HP uh, in charge of uh, privacy and security, he said that today in the world, within 4.2 seconds of every time, a new malware is being released globally, meaning that in less than five seconds, a new malware emerges in the world. This, that is why today cyber experts are having the challenge of countering the, uh, the, 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 the malware and the attacks that are coming up 
day, day by the day. It, a new malware is issued after every 4.2 seconds. Then indeed, within a minute, you will discover that more than six are released. And if you compute that within an hour, you it will become highly, highly worrisome. It could be up to 360 malwares released within that period of time. This is to show to us how cyber attacks are increasing by the day. And uh, furthermore, on the 14th of uh, June 2021, I can recall vividly that the President of the United States of America, Joe Biden, has warned the world about the dangers of uh, cyber attacks being launched in the world. He said that most probably, if care is not taken, the shoot, uh, cyber attacks and cyber breaches will lead to a what he calls as a shooting war between a major powers. This is to show to us that uh, cyber attacks and the cyber breaches taking place in the world and cyber crimes taking place in the world could lead into a shooting war, a real war, a real war between two nations. And he has warned the world about that. Why? Because other countries will live in their geographical country and they will start launching attacks on other other nations compromising their privacy and their confidentiality and many more. It is because of this the developing nations uh, need to do a lot to ensure that we do the best we can to protect our cybersphere. In Nigeria, we have so many initiatives uh, to support that. For example, we have Nigeria Data, uh, National Digital Economy Policy and Strategy, which has eight pillars. One of the pillars discusses what we call soft infrastructure. Soft infrastructure is all about cyber security. Furthermore, we have replaced the old version of computer emergency response and readiness team in NIDA. While I was there, I started the process uh, of replacing the old one with a world-class and state-of-the-art facilities in our computer emergency response and readiness team. And the federal government of Nigeria has another Nigerian sat under the Office of the National Security Advisor. And last year, I have directed Nigerian Communications Commission to also establish another computer emergency response and readiness team, which even yesterday I forwarded a letter to them requesting them with the update so that we will be able to continue to monitor potential cyber attacks and take precautions where necessary. We also have Nigeria data protection regulation, which I let the team that developed it while I was in NIDA. Uh, it is being implemented and we are in the process of upgrading the, subs the, uh, the subsidiary legislation into a full legislation. In addition to the policy we recently introduced of national identification number, of linking SIM with national identification number so that whoever is online, government will be able to at least know his identity without compromising what he does. This is also very important. And it's one of the initiatives of the United Nations that by 2030, all member countries are challenged to make sure that their citizens have legal and formal identification. We want to achieve that in Nigeria even before 2030. We also have national cybersecurity policy in place, which has been launched by President of Nigeria, President Muhammadu Buhari, under the office of NSA. These are some of the initiatives we have in place. And I do hope that uh, from this summit organized, we will be able to get more recommendations, suggestions, and constructive criticism on how to improve on what we have in place. Once again, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present the keynote speech. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening um, to everyone who's joining us. We'll just wait about a minute or two more, let people join, and then we will start. Uh, to the panelists, to the Honorable Minister, thank you very much for joining us. Um, give us about a minute, two, and then we'll kickstart our session. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Thank you for making it. Thank you, too. Okay, I think it's a good time to start. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening again. My name is Titi Akisomi, um, and I wear a number of hats, but for the session today, I am wearing my hat as a Googler, uh, someone who is uh, has been doing policy work probably for the last 20 years. Um, if you're looking for a title, my title says 
uh, historically public policy lead for Google for Western Francophone Africa. Uh, but of recent, I have become also the global policy lead for assistant. For those of you wondering what assistant is, it's that lead to annoying thing with the microphone that's across all our devices and services that you can speak to and does its best to assist you as well. Um, today, I am really honored to have hosted our call longtime friends um, and also the Honorable Minister of Communications and Digital Economy um, on this panel. I will give everyone an opportunity to be able to introduce, you know, just give us very brief introductions around yourself. Um, very briefly, a few ground rules. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, it should be on the right hand side. So the hand, my right, your left on the screen. Uh, of your screen, um, you should be able to put in questions there. I will do my best with the panelists to leave about three minutes uh, or give room for about three questions in total. So this session is around, you know, cybersecurity. Um, a few remarks before we actually get into it. So ensuring the security of the critical national infrastructures is really integral to the wider aspect of national security, preservation of economic interest, public safety, with increasing cyber attacks by state and non-state actors on nation states and industry, it has become even more important, like never before, for Nigeria and other countries to rise to the modern day threat and challenge it. However, it also presents significant opportunities. Uh, you know, the World Economic Forum in 2020, their global risk report for 2021, ranked cybersecurity failure as one of the most serious threats confronting the world. Based on research, Attacks on nation states actually doubled in the last three years. And I know that the minister, um, in his uh, keynote remarks, actually inferred this, that with the year of the pandemic, uh, we've had increased activities happening. Um, however, nation states are not the only victims, right, of cyber attacks. Um, if, uh, there are many, many new stories that have emerged of organizations, institutions, global institutions, uh, institutions that are not even technically in the tech sector being attacked. There's the case of the cyber attack that put down the gas pipelines in the US of recent, about a month and a half or two months ago. So knowing this, that there are countless losses um, and, you know, technically from the numbers that I have, Nigeria alone, based on the Serianu 2017 cyber security report, so note this is that as of 2017, hopefully more data will emerge. Nigeria alone lost about $649 million to cybercrime. Um, I know typically the narrative is, or oh, what part is Nigerian, are Nigerians or Nigerian uh, cyber attacks emerging from? But actually it also happens at home that there's a lot of millions lost. The release of the National Cybersecurity Policy and Strategy in 2014 and the Cybercrime Act in 2015 are symbolic milestones. I know, and I will pin these, that there are question marks around the review of it, right? They, I know that there's an ECOWAS case about speaking to some of the validity of it. We pin this because that is what happens with policy and regulation making, an opportunity to engage. The Cyber Crimes Act particularly imposes the obligation to designate some sector of the economy as critical national information infrastructure, while the strategy lists out 13 of such sectors. Right, the landscape in Nigeria is progressing, but it's confronted by policy limitations, adequate know how by institutions, a skills shortage, and lack of investment. Therefore, addressing these approaches requires addressing the inadequacies currently plaguing the landscape. Having said all of that, we'll get to the first session, the first part of our conversation today. The power of the internet, information, and associated technologies has brought incredible opportunities. And I'm coming to you, Honorable Minister, right? We have access to data and information that are enhancing our lives, business and economies in all sorts of ways. We have and are also witnessing daily its double-edged sword nature, typified by significant loss and or catastrophic impact to individuals, organizations, and nations. Honorable Minister, in Nigeria, the National Cybersecurity Policy and Strategy which was released, as I mentioned, in 2014, and the Cybercrime Act of 2015 are all critical pieces of legislation. Specifically to you, sir, even as you begin with a brief introduction, we know who you are, but just an indication for our listeners, what is the federal government's action plan from a policy development and more important from an implementation point of view 
towards a comprehensive cybersecurity guideline that actually addresses industries, firms, and MDAs on cyber protection and safety in Nigeria. Honorable Minister. All right, thank you very much, Siti. Nice to see you again. Um, the Honorable Minister spoke, uh, gave his keynote address. We had to leave briefly. He'll come back for the awards because um, we're currently attending the United um, Universal Postal Union Conference in Abidjan. So he asked me to stand in for him. Um, I'm Dr. Femi Adelio and, um, and his technical assistant on information technology. So, I mean, what you have said concerning cybersecurity is very important and it's very true. Um, we know how things have scaled up in terms of attacks as a result of COVID and um, adoption of digital platforms. So what is our response? You've talked about the fact that we've had um, the policy, the law, the revised policy, and some people wonder why we're having so many things. But the truth is that um, the cyber criminals are getting more sophisticated, so it's important to be able to at least try to keep peace with uh, what they are doing. So that's why we've had some refinements. The um, strategy and policy that was released last year and launched by the president, as alluded to by my boss, um, actually has an action plan. And the whole idea is that no single organization, whether it's the NSC or the ministry or NIDA or NCC can sort out the issue of cybersecurity alone. So a key aspect of our plan is collaboration. So a number of organizations, government organizations, private organizations, experts came together to put the um, policy and strategy, the revised version to bring it out. So what we are doing right now is to ensure that we have different sectoral approaches, but it's ensuring that also that it's part of um, the overall agenda of ensuring that we have a country that is cyber aware. Of course, you know that cyber security, we have cyber crime, yeah, trying to get the people that commit the crimes. Well, the more critical part is the part of cyber security, and that's the part that is really handled by the ministry. So we're building capacity, we're letting people know what cyber crime is about, what cyber security is about. And we believe that, you know, when we build that capacity, it makes it easier for people to support the government in preventing cyber crime. So basically what we're doing is to make sure that we build the capacity and then we'll collaborate. That's what we're doing. Thank you, Titi. Thank you very much, Dr. Femi, and thank you for stepping in. We understand that the HM is a very busy gentleman. I will move across right now to our brother um, from Ghana, um, Dr. Albert Antwi Boasiako. I really hope I pronounced that appropriately. Uh, he is the National Security, Cybersecurity Advisor for the Federal Ministry of Communications and Digitization in Ghana. And a similar question to you. We know that the Ghanaian Cybersecurity Act came to pass in 2020. Is there an existing implementation strategy, um, particularly around the perspective for organizations and investors? And what role do you see for the private sector? All right, thank you very much, Titi. I think um, the good news is it's not Dr. Albert here. So even if you got the name wrong, you would be pardoned. The good news is I think you got it quite right. My name is Osubedi Akupoku and I'm representing the National Cyber Security Advisor who had to take um, a quick leave to attend to a rather very important um, engagement. It's very likely that when he gets back, he may join us before the session is over if that's possible. Uh, to the substantive question in terms of what Ghana is doing about the implementation of the Act, I think, like you rightly said, the act was uh, passed into law on November, in December 29, 2020, after it was passed by Parliament in November. Basically, the Cyber Security Act seeks to establish a Cyber Security Authority to protect critical information infrastructure of Ghana and also regulate cyber security activities across the country. Prominent amongst um, the provisions in the act is indeed a critical information infrastructure which more or less seeks to secure the digital infrastructure as we have it today. So as part of the implementation of the act, there will be what we call the designation and gazetting of critical information infrastructure owners and the issuance of a cyber, a critical information infrastructure directive, which basically sets out baseline cyber security provisions, all these critical information infrastructure owners should put in place. That would also come with indeed registration of these systems and owners the development of 
a database to keep comprehensive data of these um, owners. And uh, for every cybersecurity person, risk management is an essential part of the work we do. So there'll also be a development of a cybersecurity risk management framework for all uh, the identified critical information infrastructure owners. And then definitely capacity building and awareness creation is also key. Um, the act didn't leave everything to critical information infrastructure. I think if we also know about computer emergency response team, we appreciate what it means to have sectorial computer emergency response team. So as part of the act between sections 41 and 48, there's the need to set up sectorial sets to coordinate cybersecurity related activities across those sectors. And that would include the deployment of cybersecurity incident monitoring systems and information sharing, early warning system, and definitely cybersecurity incident reporting channels and platforms. Now, we are also tackling cybersecurity public awareness and education, and it's a strategic imperative that's also captured in the National Cybersecurity Policy Strategy. There is the intention to develop national capacity towards all facets of our lives to ensure that, yes, indeed, when it comes to cybersecurity, uh, we have the necessary competence to tackle any issues that come with it. Um, children have also not been left out within section 68 and 62 to 68. We have strong provisions on child online protection to the extent that we had pro we have provisions around sextortion, where even the threat to publish non-consensual sexual images is considered as a crime that's punishable by law. All these are included in there. Um, basically, there's an implementation plan for the act, and that includes, most importantly, sustainable funding, regulatory interventions, workforce development, uh, making sure our criminal justice sector is up to the response to cybercrime, uh, whatever emerging technologies that are coming up, having appropriate legislation and framework around protecting these infrastructures. Said development is high on the agenda. And you can't talk about cybersecurity without international cooperation. Um, for our neighbors in Nigeria, for most of our international partners that we deal with, there's every intention to deepen the kind of international cooperation that exists today, and then ultimately ensure that once Ghana is as safe as it is, it definitely gets the, our neighbors and our international partners involved as well. Thank you very much. So very much appreciate you being able to step in as well and it's really great to hear that as well from ghana there are plans there's an implementation strategy that definitely keeps in mind collaboration cooperation not just within ghana in terms of the private sector and other players but also across border um i would i have follow-up questions for you and uh dr femi representing the hm around how all of this ties into a victor but before we get to it let's speak to international cooperation very briefly Jillian, I'm coming to you. Uh, Jillian Forrester, who is with the USTDA, um, as you probably know, um, there's been a cybersecurity national action plan from the Obama and the Trump uh, time, uh, the era. Um, there's also with the Biden administration, there's an executive order that actually looks to improve or is improving on the current uh, cybersecurity measures in place. Considering that your agency is involved in partnerships on behalf of the US, right, with the private sector, not just locally within your country, but internationally, particularly, um, and that you're looking to develop secure, safe, sustainable infrastructure while fostering economic growth in emerging economics, economies, you know, there's some tension that begins to sit in that space. Um, but first, I would like you to share an overview of the USCDA's involvement with the US private sectors and emerging economies, particularly as it speaks to cybersecurity and or national security, um, to the extent that you can get into the detail as well of what kind of relationships are in place that, you know, our audience today could really benefit from learning, as well as the panelists. Jillian? Great, thanks so much, TT. Um, as mentioned, my name is Jillian Forster. I'm a country manager at the US Trade and Development Agency and I cover West Africa as a part of my remit. Um, for, those of, uh, for those of you who maybe don't know us as well, USTDA is the US government's project preparation arm in emerging markets. Uh, generally, we link US businesses to export opportunities by funding project preparation and also partnership building activities that develop long lasting infrastructure. 
but also foster economic growth um, in our partner countries. And Nigeria is a major priority country for us, as is also Ghana. So excited to see uh, representative from Ghana on the panel as well. Uh, so you, at USTDA, we intervene at the early stages of project development, and we're primarily known for providing grants for feasibility studies and technical assistance. In Nigeria, for example, in the last two years, we funded a number of grants for feasibility studies, especially in the ICT sector, which has kept us very busy, even though we haven't been able to do as much travel uh, due to uh, restrictions related to, to COVID-19. Um, with all of our studies, uh, we help U.S. companies bring their expertise to those projects, and oftentimes we'll even um, help them pilot their technologies in emerging markets. Um, but I would also note that our support enables U.S. companies to share best practices uh, with local partners that they're working with and also build their capacity. So we really think that our uh, model is really a win-win for both our local partners as well as U.S. companies that are interested in, in getting involved uh, in emerging markets like Nigeria. Um, overall, we have a really long history of work in the ICT space uh, as a sector. Uh, just to give an example, 10 years ago, we supported a study with the Central Bank of Nigeria funding technical assistance to develop a shared disaster recovery center, uh, which will provide um, critical redundancy and information security for the country's financial sector. So that was several years ago. Um, but more recently on the continent, we've supported a handful of activities focused specifically on cybersecurity, uh, for example, in Kenya, uh, also in South Africa. And I would really like to do more um, in Nigeria and Ghana as well. Um, and we understand from the experts that ICT infrastructure development and really all infrastructure development, we gave the example of the colonial pipelines that you know the cybersecurity challenges affect the energy sector as well, of course. Um, but all infrastructure sh development should incorporate cyber considerations really early on. Uh, and we support work at the early stage as an agency. Uh, so cyber shouldn't be an afterthought. As the ambassador uh, noted earlier, we can't be reactive, we have to be proactive. Um, so this is why we think as USTDA is a project preparation facility um, that we're a really great partner in the sector. Um, and we are constantly working to improve how we structure our assistance in emerging markets where we're active to ensure that feasibility studies and other assistance um, are building in cybersecurity considerations, uh, not only in ICT, but in you know, transportation and energy and beyond. So as an agency, we're really demand driven. Um, we're interested in doing even more in cyber. Um, we're always looking for new partners and new ways to support secure and resilient infrastructure with our tools. Um, and TT, as you mentioned, you know, we are working with, uh, with US companies uh, and constantly you know, in conversation with them as well in terms of where they're seeing opportunities in Nigeria and elsewhere, um, and how we can uh, learn from uh, their experiences and uh, potentially help them do more uh, in emerging markets, but also you know, to make sure that we're using best practices in our programming as well. So thank you for the question and look forward to speaking more on the panel. Thank you very much, Jillian, I really appreciate it. Um, this makes a really good segue to Merit, Merit Bayer. Uh, the Principal Office of the CSRSO, Amazon Web Services, um, a fellow private sector player. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. Having heard, you know, with the USDA, with the Nigerian government, the Ghanaian government, the kinds of implementation strategies that are in place, including having at least um, an understanding of the acts um, as they currently are. Um, as the private sector, um, we tend to, companies like yourself, like yours and mine, tend to partner with government through alliances aimed at protecting consumers within and beyond physical jurisdictions. Again, because the services and the platforms that we provide do not have these geographical boundaries. And that comes with its tension. So I want you to speak in two ways. Please speak to the work that you have done and continue to do with government's national strategies around cybersecurity. Think approach, learning, knowledge gaps, and then I would ask you that you also speak to some of the challenges that you have faced with such partnerships and how Amazon, uh, as an example, is addressing this. Merit, over to you. Hi, thanks. Um, Merit Barry here. As mentioned, I'm a principal in the office of the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer at Amazon. So I spend about half my time trying to make our security better as an enterprise. And then about half my time um, having CISO to CISO and other executive conversations um, around the globe with um, entities, both public and private sector, around raising their 
to play when it comes to security, especially as they move to the cloud, because Amazon Web Services is a cloud platform. Um, so I think, you know, of course, we partner closely with the U.S. government, among other uh, friendly governments, as they seek to enforce some of these um, cybersecurity considerations. Um, that being said, you know, my focus is really on raising the state of play for security at an enterprise level. So being able to do not just scalable innovation, and as you alluded to earlier, in the kind of context of what feels like limitless access to data, um, but finding ways to um, derive insights securely and to do that in a way that is deliberate and um, has a coherent governance strategy around the ways that you're using that data. Um, so I think that while, of course, there are important um, relationships and we often seek to help uh, governments understand how cloud computing works, because a lot of the kind of um, legacy expectations for where the security ownership lies look different in cloud, um, where you can interact with infrastructure as code and therefore do security as code. Um, a lot of these then you know, you've got ephemeral architectures and elastic IPs. And, and so this process itself looks different as you articulate, you know, what you can help to go after and other aspects of things that, you know, we, of course, want our platform to be secure and, um, you know, to not have bad behavior. So I think, you know, we work with them um, on how they can understand how it works and then how we can be helpful and, you know, um, provide a kind of safe environment for enterprises to build upon. And then I do a lot of work in terms of coaching enterprises in how to think of scale, um, how to do more automation, how to do more uh, remediation as a um, kind of uh, computer driven, you know, code driven enterprise instead of the is there a rogue server under someone's desk type of security work? Um, so just thinking in terms of that next generation of uh, interactions with technology, how we can automate away as much as possible and reserve for human judgment, truly novel or high stakes situations. Those are the kinds of um, goods that I am chasing to be able to make the secure thing to do the easiest thing to do. Thank you very much, Merritt. A couple of things you met, you 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 referred to there um, around cross uh, cross border data transfers, around being able to you know pinpoint and build capacity uh, consistently. As um, I want to come to Timmy Tope Aladenusi, who is the risk advisory leader at Deloitte West Africa, um, with my first set of questions. You know, with this preamble that the ability to move data across borders has become a vital part of businesses daily operations practically there's no company that'll be able to do business or take part in international trade without at the very least having the ability to transfer data whether they are small or whether they are huge corporations um investing globally right with locations across board um according to on cloud computing is one of the major contributors to this kind of prominence right uh the prominence around you know communication being easier etc um and there's a whole range of technologies that actually supports that. So to you, um, as a risk advisory leader, Timmy Tope, uh, with Deloitte, um, as a technology practitioner involved with working with various sectors in West Africa, could you please share a bit more light on how organizations you have worked with are technologies using data to drive business growth locally and internationally, right? And I want you to be able to speak within that context and then reference the trend that we tend to see around enforced data localization, where governments particularly are taking a position where certain data needs to sit locally. Um, if we have to be talk about, please go ahead. All right, thank you very much. And I want to thank the organizers for having me. Uh, you've asked uh, two very important questions. Um, the fourth has to do with, uh, you know, emerging technology with respect to using data to drive growth, both um, locally and um, internationally and what i have seen organizations do i'm privileged to work with um, several organizations um, within west africa uh, because i lead a uh, risk advisory in west africa and um, in, in nigeria about 30 percent of the continent just stock exchange and several banks and government institutions and we've we've seen an increased um, you know reliance on data to drive organization growth as a matter of fact these days when you relate with companies, they will tell you that we are a data-driven organization and a technology-led organization. So it's a common theme that is used to describe organizations these days. 
I'll take, for example, the API and open banking, uh, which is the application programming interfaces that allows collaboration between organizations that would normally be called uh, that would normally be competitors. Uh, look at the fintechs, for for example, they are forging partnership with banks, and look at the the kind of um, strength and time that they've been able to gain within a very short time. Where our fintech companies are now bigger, some of them bigger than uh, banks who have been around for years, and that's because of data that they have access to, being able to you know transact data between um, organizations and even from country to country. Then also analytics, many uh, AI, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, we've seen many many companies, um, you know, derive insights from data. Although there are several arguments whether um, you know using data to transform your business is the right way, whether um, that will only give you some little incremental um, growth as opposed to a step change growth. But beyond the argument, one thing is very clear. Uh, data is being used to predict how well to service customers. So we have better customer experience as opposed to the times where you just take all products and push to all customers. Right now, there is a fit for purpose, you know, targeting in terms of saying, um, you know, this is the next best thing to give this customer based on the trends that we have, we have seen, you know, from the data that we have from there. Then we have robotics and um, robotic process of automation. Uh, many organizations, especially in the FSI space, uh, right now, they are they started using lots of bots, uh, whereby you use uh, rather than using human beings to perform uh, some part of, some activities that are routine, you, you automate those processes and allow bots to do those work because those data are the defined set; they are predictable, and then um, you can easily uh, work with them. And uh, one more thing I'd like to mention around how data is being used to drive growth is the area of cloud and emerging technology. Uh, the cloud is really, you know, being adopted widely um, in Nigeria, and because of um, it reduces the entry barrier for startups, and so a number of organizations have quickly gained operational um, efficiency. And the good thing is that we have um, good um, data centers in Nigeria that offer cloud services, and um, so even with the restrictions regarding localization of data. Uh, many companies are beginning to trust the local organizations because the, the facilities they have is comparable to that in other parts of the world. And so we are seeing a lot of adoption uh, regarding cloud. And that is the next question which you asked, which is about localization of data. Now, this is becoming very important because these are regulations that require data that are collected from one country citizens to be retained or processed in that particular country. And Almost, uh, a number of countries are now having um, localization um, laws. You know, some country, um, you know, like like Russia, India, China, South Africa, and even Nigeria, we have uh, localization laws. Uh, and this, if you look at this, all these laws, the scope um, is different in terms of the kind of data that can be, um, you know, shared. Now, the, the, the challenge with this is is that. Uh, for, we're talking about trade and free trade across Africa. And we, for us to have that seamless trade, we need to um, you know, be very careful with the kind of localization laws that we have, especially because trade depends uh, you know, on access to cross-border data flows. And when we, are, when we have so much restrictions um, on these um, data uh, flows, then it, is, it has um, a potential to affect commerce. Um, if you look at that of Nigeria, I don't think Nigerians' uh, location laws are, are, are that stringent. Uh, if you look at it in comparison to um, several other countries. But I believe that there is a lot of learning to do in this space, and that at some point we need to revisit some of the location laws, you know, even across um, countries to ensure that it doesn't stifle uh, innovation and commerce. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jimmy Topway. You have touched on a couple of things, and I'm just going to pick on one so I can takandu of uh, the NSA um, and it was around Nigeria's laws around data localization and the status of it. Um, the Nigeria cloud computing policy, Dr. Bala, uh, makes it mandatory for a certain category of data to be stored on site with the public authority and locally in Nigeria. Right. Similarly, the national policy for the promotion of indigenous content in the telecommunication sector and a host of other laws actually tend to propose uh, an enforcement right of a particular kind of data being stored locally uh, and within the context of cybersecurity, 
Um, I can speak to, you know, the 2019 version of the data protection bill, making it mandatory to store data locally as well, with a fine of about 8 billion naira for any defaults. Uh, these policy trends tend to suggest that government's inclination is towards localization of data, where possible, in its entirety. Um, I'd love to be able to hear from you, Dr. Bala, and for the rest of uh, our panelists as well as our audience, that your specific thoughts um, as the agency that is more or less charged with being able to ensure our cybersecurity. Um, what is the government looking to include in the pending data protection bill, if you can speak to that, but then speaking wide, a bit more widely as well to um, the work that the NSC and the NGCIT actually does? Uh, thank you very much for having me, um, Titi. Um, 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 uh, going back to um, your questions on um, data localizations and uh, specifically um, what um, the um, uh, proposed data protection law uh, intent, uh, I think it's going to entail. Um, I, I think uh, long overdue because for a very long time um, uh, we've been working on um, localizing uh, data, certain type of data for the protection of um, our um, critical assets. Um, uh, if you, uh, it's public knowledge that uh, most of the um, criminality online are actually perpetrated by non-state actors, but we are getting to have an increase in involvement of states in um, criminality online. I mean, involvement of states in um, also of things uh, in the cyberspace. So that is getting um, states very worried. When we, when we um, uh, localize our data, it makes it safe for us to be able to actually protect our data against some of those uh, um, state, state actors. Uh, um, the existing laws that we have and how easier it is for our laws not to be, are not too strangers as compared to uh, laws from other states, which I agree with him. And I also agree with um, um, the point he made about um, being ease and I've been being wary of um, how we actually uh, 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 determine um, our localization laws so that at least we don't uh, we don't uh, frustrate the uh, 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 transfer of data in terms of commercialization or stuff like that. Now on the data protection uh, bill, I was part of the based on a, a holistic stakeholder uh, engagement in Ankara-Baten. Um, and also the present look uh, data protection bill, we made a, a substantial input to it. I won't be able to tell you categorically that these are the things that are going to be part of it, especially in, in terms of uh, data localization. However, uh, substantially is going to be uh, around the protection of um, personal data and uh, mm -hmm. Uh, um, uh, close to, I mean, related to uh, and, uh, the GDPR, because the uh, data protection is actually queued uh, in line with the Convention One, the European Convention One O Eight, which also uh, 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 is in line with how uh, the data protection, I mean, the GDPR was developed. So basically, uh, on issue of NGSET. I think uh, it is it is important to know that NGSAD is a domicile in Office of National Security Advisor, and based on the current um, uh, cyber security policy uh, and strategy that was launched in twenty uh, in this early this year by Mr. President in February, actually domicile the NGSAD under the National Cyber Security Coordination Center. Why? Because uh, in in the whole scheme of our uh, um, strategy. A, an ecosystem a uh, in it where uh, the emphasis is at center, and you have um, other uh, sectoral sat uh, domiciled at uh, maybe uh, regulators that actually handles or uh, regulates critical infrastructure uh, um, owners, and with that you're able to fuse and connect with NGSAT. So it is important that we have that centrally rather than having it independent, as um, uh, based on what the uh, the, the access. And on issue of, um, I think, uh, the the uh, coordination of cyber security nationally, uh, National Cyber Security Coordination Center is going to handle that uh, efficiently, centrally, based on uh, the provision of the strategy. Because uh, presidency, 
because the president, president actually mandates the Office of National Security yeah. to actually coordinate the issue of that because he feels that it is vital enough for him to have it centrally. So I think uh, NGSAT is is uh, like more central than having it independent in terms of uh, coordination of um, uh, uh, cyber security incidents or incident management response. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bala. Really appreciate your, your detailed response. Um, and at this point, I will ask one question and I'll ask, you know, the various, I'll, I'll ask the various uh, panelists to please respond. Um, actually, starting with you, Merit, coming back to you, Merit, um, around what has yes, been Amazon's Hello? response and approach to, you know, operating in countries where data localization um, has been enforced in some way or has been mandated, if I use a softer word, um, if you can speak to that. And then I will come to you, Gillian, before I then return to Dr. Femi representing the HM. No? Yes, yeah, so, um, thanks. It's an interesting textured um, topic, right? Because while cloud in some ways abstracts away your um, you know, considerations around exactly where your data centers are, Otherwise, these data localization requirements make it very um, nebulous to wade through in terms of some of the regulations and then some of the data localization requirements, which can be in tension with one another and also can be in tension with some of the best practices around, um, you know, architecting for high availability by having redundancy across multiple areas. Um, so those are challenges that enterprises face. I've put a couple of links in the chat. Um, that are helping folks to navigate through some of these uh, compliance requirements. Um, but overall, uh, it may feel unsatisfying, but these are ones that um, enterprises navigate basically as they um, you know, enter into specific industries or specific countries that have those requirements. And I think you know, the, um, the ultimate take home is that we can help folks work through it. Um, you know, some of the most highly regulated industries like financials and, um, uh, whatever, oil and gas and other uh, really uh, core industries are running on AWS, not to mention governments themselves. Um, you know, so there are ways to architect for it. You have the choice as a customer to choose which region you are um, locating your resources in, and we would never move from the re region you've selected. Um, but getting sort of in the weeds about exactly how those data flows go, Navigations that we help customers through. And I think it is one of the considerations that I'd love to see governments be aware of as they write these data localization requirements that they can often have unintended consequences, um, both in terms of costs for enterprises locally, as well as, um, you know, potential to hamstring some of the global enterprise priorities that one might want, might want to have. Um, and so finding ways to do it's some of the same policy goals, but without hamstringing your local economy. Thank you very much, Merit. Gillian, um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, the NIST out of the US, has done what is termed a remarkable job in advancing the cybersecurity framework and standards, right? Um, are there lessons that you could actually point to uh, that Nigeria can take away um as it's looking to create its own equivalent of an nist yeah sure um thank you for the question and i'm glad that we uh we shared questions in advance because i actually i don't work at nist um so i had to do a little bit of research on this one i actually called someone at nist yesterday to get some of their thoughts um and in terms of lessons learned they mentioned three things uh, number one top-down regulations and standards often do not work well. Um, and NIST has found that when they do best when they speak with industry and rely a great deal on the expertise and experience of others, uh, especially in the quickly moving tech and cybersecurity space. So talking with industry and stakeholders to develop standards and a framework is really important. Number two, uh, related to this, uh, they mentioned that standards should be complementary and developed in a transparent manner. And then number three, for cyber, uh, they really emphasize a risk-based approach, um, that that's key, um, meaning that cybersecurity standards shouldn't all be very prescriptive and a checklist of 200 plus things to do. Um, not or all organizations or even small companies, of course, are able to do this, um, but companies or agencies, even with limited resources, should just look at where their risks are, 
threats that are unique to them and what the priorities are, and then develop a plan to address those priorities. Um, a risk-based approach isn't prescriptive. Um, in terms of, of whether or not Nigeria should develop its own NIST, um, that's not for me to say, but my, my, my Nigerian counterparts and Ghanaian counterparts here can definitely engage with NIST through working with my US government colleagues at the State Department and Foreign Commercial Service um, and all the experts based at the US Embassy, and I think they would really welcome that collaboration. So thanks for the question. Very much, um, Gillian, very much aware you don't work at NIST, but it was an opportunity again as the development agency to create this connection, particularly with countries that are being proactive about, you know, engaging. I'm, I'm coming to, I believe it's still Dr. Femi who's representing the HM, correct? Um, you know, based on the conversation that you've just heard, what are your thoughts? Um, I also know that there's a question um, on the chat that's asking how can students actually benefit from this? And I know that, you know, there are a couple of Nigerian universities that are now offering courses and degrees around cybersecurity. So how do we connect the dots? Yes, build industry, learn from, you know, uh, best practices from uh, a NIST, et cetera. What's the plan ahead for Nigeria? Thank you very much, Titi. Can you hear me? Okay, so basically, like um, I'd said earlier, we're focused on capacity building. We want to make sure that not just our agencies that handle cybersecurity have the capacity, we're also making available courses for students, for people that are not in school to make sure that they can develop the capacity um, in the area of emerging technologies, including cybersecurity. Right now we'll have um, an academy online, it's called the Digital Nigeria Platform Academy. Uh, people can register there and get certifications related to emerging technologies, including cybersecurity and we are collaborating. I know the um, counterpart from Ghana talked about international collaboration. I'd emphasize the local collaboration, but we are not just collaborating with people within Nigeria, we're also collaborating with people outside. And that's why we've had some things to do with USTDA, NIST and so on. So um, we're open to partnerships. Um, the government really understands that we don't have all the answers. We're willing to collaborate with stakeholders to ensure that we we'll come up with policies that are robust enough to ensure that we can develop our cybersecurity sector in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Femi. Um, can we talk, well, ask that, you know, give us a few last words, particularly around being able to collaborate and particularly the kind of services that you provide, um, and then we'll wrap up, because we are out of time. All right, just to, just to mention about collaboration, um, cyber is not a local issue, it's a global issue. And so for us to stay ahead, we need to collaborate both within the country and also outside the country. Um, the more we collaborate, the better for us. Uh, we have experience. Uh, we have a security option center uh, within Deloitte and a cyber center that gives us access to see attacks across, um, across the world as it happens, and uh, even within Nigeria. And many times you see that an attack that one company has suffered from is the same that another company is going to suffer from the next minute or the next hour. So when, once we have a very strong collaboration and we build um, a, is a good system where breaches are reported and, and, you know, they, and you know, they, they have their own enforcement regarding reporting you know, incidents as they happen, trading breaches, that will help us to ensure that issues that affect one company or one organization does not affect the other because you know, at, at a very good time we are up to speed with what is happening in various um, organizations so collaboration is very important uh, you cannot fight security alone it's like going to war alone and you are, you are going to you are going to lose so we need that coordination and collaboration for us to stay ahead together because it's a collective fight the, the bad guys are, are collaborating people to the dark web they are sharing information from time to time so if we must stay ahead we must also collaborate thank you very much very much um, it's a great place to actually and to reemphasize that indeed the power of the internet has brought amazing opportunities, even in the space of cybersecurity. Collaboration, cooperation is essential across all sectors, but most importantly, fostering these kinds of conversations that will lead to actionable items later is critical. Thank you very much for 50 minutes of your time. Um, I tried to reference some of the questions that I saw uh, in the chat. I hope we have more opportunity to continue to engage. So the panelists, deeply appreciate it. Um, and to the APC, thank you for the opportunity and the platform as well. 
Um, we do have a sponsors. We are going to be moving on to the next session. There will be a sponsor reel that we'll go through and I'll see you in the other sessions. Thank you very much again and have a really great day ahead of you. Thank you. Duo Push is the easiest and fastest way to securely log into your accounts. Just enter your username and password and Duo sends an authentication request directly to your smartphone. Tap approve and you're in. Duo Mobile, one touch authentication. Even if this guy over here stole your password, Duo protects your account. We'll even alert the system administrator when the request is denied. Duo Mobile, stopping credential theft with a single push. Uh, thank you very much uh, for a very productive session. And uh, without repeating the protocol I have earlier mentioned, I will go ahead. However, I want to use the opportunity to recognize my friend and brother, Mr. Defo Faulkner, the president of ABC Nigeria and the country director of IBM Nigeria and West Africa. And we also thank them for being the sponsors and partners of this very important event. Um, I have been given the privilege to announce the winners of uh, starting with the third prize, then coming to the second prize, then the first prize. Uh, the third prize, uh, based on what has been presented to me, is, uh, is presented to uh, 5YB4RHND. So that team has won the third prize. And I, on behalf of the organizers and the co-sponsors, I congratulate them uh, on that achievement. And I encourage them to do more uh, in the future. We move to the second prize. Thank you. Uh, the second prize will go to team M4X underscore H-E-4-D-R-O-O-F. I also congratulate the uh, team that won the second prize, and I encourage them to do more next time. Then we move to the first prize. Uh, the first prize will go to team red team nigeria and i congratulate them for what they have uh, achieved and i encourage them to try to maintain the tempo so congratulations to uh, the, uh, the one who won the first prize second prize and the third prize and i thank the organizers for presenting these uh, awards to them and uh, on behalf of the federal government of nigeria we are most appreciative and we do hope that this will continue being organized from time to time for the benefit of, of our citizens and, uh, and, uh, and other participants from the neighboring countries. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Edet. I work for the National Information Technology Development Agency where I serve in the legal unit as the head of um, legal unit. I am an assistant director. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'm next. My name is John Edokbolo. I work for Microsoft and I lead the team of commercial and government affairs practitioners for what we call the emerging markets in the, in the Middle East and Africa. Thank you. I'm Honorable Dr. Chukwemeka Ujam. I am of the House of Representatives, former Deputy of Telecoms and a Biometric and IT Security. Good day, everyone. I am Telumu George Maria Tiendezwa. Um, I'm an Assistant Director in the uh, Federal Ministry of Justice. Um, 
Okay, um, um, we can proceed to Chief Anthony Idibe to yes, make his thank introduction. You very much. Yes, my name is Anthony Idibe. I'm a senior advocate of Nigeria and I'm senior partner at Punuka Attorneys and Solicitors. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The first question goes to Mr. Emmanuel Edit. And um, data localization policies are gaining traction around the world and different governments have their reasons for taking this position. We're curious to know why the Nigerian government has taken this position and what it considers to be critical national data that needs to be stored locally. Over to you, sir. All right, thank you very much, Jesse. Um, this is quite an interesting um, question considering the context of the um, data protection regime going around the world as well as the um, information security necessity um, due to the increased use of um, information technology to deal with issues around carrying out government transactions and all the other things that has to do with information that is absolutely necessary for the um, running of government. I, I think we have to um, set this within a context. Um, we are running a digital economy, which is primarily driven by data. And data is essential for every type of communication. There's also the danger of losing data. So we have to strike a balance between what we may consider to be important data, um, where we try to avoid or minimize the risk of losing such important data, and also the need to provide data in order to assist um, transactions and um, activities of individuals, because almost every um, application you run these days is based on data. So um, the government has taken the position that there is a need to protect certain data, and there's also a need to share um, certain type of data. Um, in the um, National Cloud Policy, um, which was, I think, published in 2019, um, the official position of the government is that data should be shared and also cloud data should be the first type of approach in terms of data storage. However, there is a need to classify the type of data that you share and the type of data that you don't share. So it's not data localization um, and block, as we would say, but rather the proper management of data to ensure that um, certain type of data do not go out there. For example, the policy classifies data in, um, uh, in four, four categories, I think. The official public data, which is non-confidential, which can easily be shared. Um, then there's confidential routine government business data, which we have certain types of restriction. Um, also, there's the secret, secret um, data, which is sensitive to government and um, restriction on how to share such data. And then there's the data that has to do with um, the type of information that will affect national security. Um, that's the type that um, is suggested to be strictly um, localized. So that's, that's all about um, data localization as far as the government is concerned. So if you have data such as agricultural data, um, commerce data, natural resource data. Those are data that can be shared because people may need them to actually carry out business with Nigeria. But where the data is of such a nature that it may affect national security, where um, the government says that such data must be stored locally. Thank you very much. There are arguments for and against data localization. And I'd like to share a bit of information that will serve as a backdrop for my next question. It is essential that data move freely in a global digital economy so that people and organizations have access to information that they need no matter where they are. This helps to boost global e-commerce. Global businesses may need to maintain and transfer personal and commercial data across borders to keep track of their customers' orders and product supplies. Cross-border flow of data promotes social good, helping with responses to disasters where humanitarian agencies are more effective if they have access to data in affected places. 
These are just a few examples. According to McKinsey report, data flows accounted for $2.8 trillion of global GDP in 2014. And cross-border data flows now generate more economic value than traditional flows of traded goods. Similarly, a study of Digital Europe indicated that support for international data transfers can add 2 trillion euros and 2 million jobs to Europe's GDP by 2030. We do know that restrictions on cross-data flows do have economic cost. A World Bank study of six developing countries and the EU28 found that requirements restricting data flows can reduce GDP by up to 1.7%, investments up to 4.2%, and exports by 1.7%. And this brings me to an analogy I'd like to share. When highways are built to connect people and cities, we know there are gains such as increase in trade and the flow of human and material resources. However, with these gains comes the risk of an increase in the loss of lives from the increase in speed permitted on highways. Our normal reaction to this is not to manufacture cars that go at a maximum speed of 20 miles per hour or to stop building highways, thereby reducing connectivity between people. Instead, we build in better safety measures into our cars. We give speed limits and we make laws that persecute traffic offenders. So my question, Mr. Edit, is would it be wrong to apply this logic to the risk that cross-border flows pose to data privacy? Is data localization the best solution? Rather, should we not consider the option of constructive alternatives to data localization? Over to you, sir. All right, thank you very much, Essie. That's, that, that's a very interesting um, analogy and a very interesting um, question. Well, the, the point here has always been that, um, like you used the car analogy, there is a need for safety measures and speed limits. There's also a need not to allow a child drive a car. So um, no matter the measures you put in, there has to be certain kinds of restriction. If we are talking about personal data, the context of personal data is that it's absolutely Please necessary. Can others hear Mr. Edit? Yes, we can hear him. Okay, thank That's you so much. Thank you. Okay, sorry, I say you're not hearing me. Um, but what I was saying was that there is absolutely um, a need to have cross-border data flow. We are talking about personal data. Um, the government has no issue with that because at the end of the day, um, international transactions are what the kind of things that we promote. However, there's a need to regulate that transborder flow. Um, in terms of data localization of personal data, um, we, I'll speak from neither end, we are not in support of total localization of personal data, no. But we would like to see a situation where there is logical control, not just physical and geographical control, but logical control of personal data in every form of transaction. We would appreciate any form of um, what you may call innovative way of ensuring that data is protected in order to promote the use of data um, so I, I think I think you called it um, constructive alternative. Yes, that can be considered. But what we are saying is that there is a need to balance security and commercial interest, just like there's a need to always balance privacy and security. So in terms of personal data, we would actually promote the exchange of personal data for legal purposes whether local or international. But in a situation where the exchange of data will cause um, security threats and affect the interest of our national security, um, that is where we have an issue and would like to ensure that data is adequately secure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. And Finally, you're you. 
Yes, I just did. Thank you so much. <laughs> I was so relieved. I, I, I don't know what was wrong between my connection. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much, sir, for those points. And we do agree that there could be threats to data if there's cross-border flows. But what we're trying to find out is, shouldn't we find those alternatives? And is the government doing that instead of just taking the position of data localization? So is the government already looking into alternatives to this? The simple answer to that is that the government has not taken um, a position that is absolutely do data localization. Like I mentioned before, it all has to do with the nature of the data. If it's critical national information, uh, national security data, yes, government is very interested in restricting the flow of such data or the movement of such data. But where the data will actually support commercial activities, will actually provide opportunities for um, the benefit of digital economy in Nigeria, government is in support of flow of those data, provided there are adequate safeguards to protect the integrity of the data. Thank you very much, sir. And so my next question is for Mr. John Edupola. Some countries might want to adopt alternative options to data localization, and they could begin by encouraging businesses to improve transparency on how they manage data and having better developed economies provide capacity building assistance to developing economies. So surely the private sector has a role to play in this. Also, a 2019-2020 official annual cybersecurity jobs report indicated that there are more than 3.5 million unfilled cybersecurity jobs globally, marking a 350% growth in the last seven years. So my question to you, sir, is what is the private sector's role in capacity building and promoting opportunities for Nigerians to pursue a career in the cybersecurity sector. All right. Thank you very much. And I hope you can hear me very well. Yes, I can, loud and clear. Absolutely. Thanks. And, and thanks for the question and for the opportunity to be on the panel. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll start off, because I couldn't, I couldn't help myself. I didn't want to interrupt, but I'll, I'll start off by saying, on the point you were making around um, data localization, um, yes. and I see the point you were trying to make when you were saying, uh, that perhaps localization doesn't equate to security, and then yes. maybe around um, what kind of um, access to data, protecting uh, data, be it on networks, be it on devices, be it on applications, to make sure that yes. uh, you don't have unauthorized access to them, or you don't use them for criminal. Uh, criminal activities, and to safeguard the integrity and the confidentiality of that data. Yeah. Of course, you would, you would, there will always be a situation where you need, for whatever reason, some kind of data to stay in country or in your possession. It's like an individual. If you, you have certain kind of um, um, assets that you probably don't want to put in the bank, you probably feel safer putting under your bed. It doesn't matter whether it's safer there or not, but that's just what you want to do. And I think that's yeah. the point that Mr. Emmanuel was making to say, look, data classification is important. Let's just see what kind of data uh, sensitivity around some. And, uh, but the, the, the risk is just making sure that you don't overclassify, because for countries that are taking real cloud first uh, approaches to consumption of IT infrastructure, even in the public sector, like in the UK, you typically find out that less than 5% of government data is actually top secret, uh, because there are costs to hosting them yourself, costs to um, domesticating applications, uh, because you want to have them resident, there are costs that there are um, computing power that you don't enjoy when you don't use, uh, consume uh, cloud, public cloud, so I think that's the fine balance that every government is trying to work around the world. That fine balance between um, providing security, not stifling innovation, but also making sure that people have access to data. And it, it will continue to be evolving uh, in, in, that, in that regard. But to the particular question around uh, skills in the cybersecurity uh, space and the role that uh, private sector should play, 
in terms of uh, enhancing capacity in that field. You're totally right. I work for Microsoft, one of the largest technology companies in the world. And there are skills that I need for the kind of product that I provide, the kind of service I want to provide. I see uh, skills that are required in my customer space. I see skills required in, in the public sector uh, space. Uh, maybe because of the kind of products that we have, like LinkedIn, we have access to be able to see what kind of, what are the in-demand cybersecurity jobs that are out there. And because of that unique perspective, we're then able to work with governments to, and also in-house to tailor uh, the kind of uh, learning, the kind of skilling that is required to be able to meet those demands in the cyber uh, security space, uh, and then work with government to definitely help skill the workforce. And we've done, we've been able to do some things like that, even with the Nigerian government, like the minister, uh, the digital economy, they launched the digital digital Nigeria uh, platform, and companies like Microsoft, Microsoft. Other OEMs are also contributing to that space, contributing content, contributing low cost certifications so that people are able to and they are able to position themselves very well for, um, for, for the jobs that are out there. Uh, last year, when COVID hit and we did those, we did in house research, particularly because of the graph that we have from, from LinkedIn and from GitHub, uh, we, we found we in the next five years, there are going to be at least 149 million jobs created in the data economy, and at least six million of those globally, six million of those will be in the cybersecurity space. So the role of, this, of, of, of companies like ourselves and the private sector is how do we then help the government um, train the workforce? How do we help them get the skills that they require to be able to meet that demand if we are going to truly digitize the economy going forward? And, and that's something that we're doing with the government. We recently announced a, a joint uh, announcement with the, the, the Vice President of Nigeria to train 5 million Nigerians uh, over the next four, three years uh, digitally to be able to position them for this. But I also want to say that training the, the current workforce, training the public sector uh, to be able to use uh, digital skills, uh, digital tools and have digital skills is one thing. But I think one of the areas where we don't see a lot of investment is the system itself, right from the primary schools, from the STEM and all of that, because those are the people that are going to feed into the pipeline in the, of, of skills. Because in this increasingly digital world, where people can have jobs and, and work anywhere in the world, we are going to lose out as a nation because we wouldn't be able to have people from other places take up these jobs. And I think that's an area that we need to focus on, both the private sector and the public sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I go to my second question for you, um, while you were making a point to sort of um, elucidate on Mr. Edit's position, um, a question came to mind. Wouldn't you agree that the safety of data is more dependent on how strong encryption is on devices and the safety around uh, the perimeter, perimeter of um, servers? The environment where they're kept that that is kept safe is more important than where data itself is stored in terms of it's in this place locally would you agree uh, cyber security is a complex it's a complex uh it's a complex topic right it's not it's not very it's not as simple as that um okay. uh, it's not as simple as that in the sense that um, of course, and that's what a lot of the, the better laws are trying to do, right? The be better guidelines are trying to do to say, okay, what are, the, what are the kind of security safeguards, technological safeguards like encryption you know, have in place to be able to make sure that data, uh, unauthorized access to data uh, is reduced because uh, cyber breaches is not something that you are going to avoid, but it's more around how do you protect against it? How do you detect it? And how do you respond to it? And a lot of that would also, uh, a lot of what will also come into that would be organizational, uh, culture, it will also be uh, how you train the workforce, how you train those that have access to the data uh, to be able to uh, have the better behaviors online and to be able to detect this. Because the truth of the matter is, the aspect of where the data is, whether it's local, whether it's in the public cloud, a lot of the cyber breaches that happen, happen at the at the at the at the at the point of the user, right? When it, okay. 
games and they take those and then it's back in our side it doesn't matter where the phone okay actually but it's not it's not as simple okay thank you so how can the private sector support the government to ensure internet safety generally and child online safety specifically all right so that's due to me right yes that's for you okay. mr yeah <laughs> so digital safety is it's uh it's not a not just a job for 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 the government particularly for for when it comes to children online um it's what i'll call a is a society-based approach uh, which is effort from the private sector, efforts from the government, of course, law enforcement, efforts from academia, research, efforts from NGOs. You know, it all comes into, into, in, into this approach on how can we protect uh, children uh, online from exploitation, especially sexual exploitation, you know. And I think somebody like, if I use a Microsoft, for instance, who is a provider of, 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 of solutions, online solutions that children are likely to consume. I think it to make sure that we have the right code of place to make sure that our products are not used to exploit children online and to also have tools built into the into the solutions, into the services, into the software that we put that that out there. Whether it's uh, we're using uh, automated detection uh, methods or we are using human methods to be able to detect and to be able to take out uh take out the infringing materials from our from our, from our platform but there's also a role to play to partner with governments you know law enforcement and uh, ngos that are working in this field uh to share information to contribute to, to to contribute to research in this field to share data to share technology so to speak as well to help combat this many is because like i said it, it has to be a an approach from a community based approach to be able to secure children online for instance we have this free uh solution it's called photo dna that helps to be able to uh through looking at some digital signatures to be able to help people governments tool developers to build tools into their solutions to be able to help detect images for instance even videos online that may be exploiting children. And this is something that we provide free of charge to law enforcement, provide free of charge to other developers for them to be able to use. And there are organizations, there are alliances out there that we can we contribute to, to be able to make sure that there's research and there's shared information to be able to help uh, everyone combat this menace of, of child online abuse. Thank you very much, sir. And my next question is for our Honorable Dr. Emeka Ujam. Artificial intelligence and blockchain have enabled a more connected world with the sharing of data. Innovation and the growth of any economy can be stifled if data is not allowed to move freely. So in your estimation, sir, how important is the cross flow of data to a nation's economy, especially in the private sector? And how is the government's stance on data localization likely to affect creativity and innovation? So my next question is for Mr. Tellerwin George Maria Yendezwa from the Ministry of Justice. A Clark School study at the University of Maryland reported that cyber attacks occur every 39 seconds. The FBI also reported a 300% increase in cyber attacks since COVID-19. So I'd like to use another analogy here. If statistics were given that 1,000 cyber criminals were apprehended on a weekly basis, we might say, wow, that's a lot. This looks like success. But if we were to be given further information, such as 100,000 cyber crimes are committed weekly, it wouldn't look so much like success anymore because context does matter. So, sir, my question is, what are the indices for measuring the success of implementing cybersecurity laws. So um, the, the the issue around measuring the success of uh, cybersecurity laws um, is it's a bit 
it, it goes beyond just the laws itself. So um, first of all, it's like asking someone if you are sure that you are healthy. Um, that question is difficult to answer because you as an individual, you can only do so much to ensure that you live healthy or you, um, you carry out a healthy lifestyle. But in absolute terms, to say whether you are healthy is dependent on a whole lot of things that you can't uh, even determine. So um, to the point that we, first of all, start off by identifying policy objectives, policy priorities, um, and we outline this out, just like we have policy um, priorities that are outlined in our national cybersecurity policy. You then know that there are laws which you need to put in place. Um, when you put these laws in place, you then need to understand that you need to build capacity of your people to implement those laws. So all of this is like trying to live healthy. But in measuring the success of your um, cybersecurity laws, you need to take in a whole lot of things, like basically your the, the cyber resilience metrics. And the, the time here is too short to begin to elaborate on this, but you can then you can begin to look at things like your maximum um, takedown time, your response, um, your recovery point objectives, um, your recovery time objectives. All of this can be measured in, 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 in a set of metrics to gauge how good your cybersecurity laws are doing. You know, um, but that's something that will take a lot more time to elaborate on, not, not for a short in, intervention like this. But the point is, yes, uh, when you put in the right cybersecurity laws, you expect that um, you should have a certain level of success. It might not be completely 100% um, scientific measurement, but you can use stuff like your cyber resilience metrics your recovery time, how long it takes you. For example, how long it takes you to discover uh, maybe a, a particular breach in a particular sector. So all of that comes in. But it is also um, a combination of capacity building, building the capacity of your people to be able to implement these laws effectively, as well as um, ensure detection. Thank you, sir. Um, my second question is, what are the ongoing efforts or plans, if any, to build human capacity, both quantitatively and qualitatively, to address cybercrime? Um, if you could highlight initiatives, if any, to build the capacity of judges and legislators to become abreast of new technologies. Um, OK, is it? Thank you. Now, this is. Um, a much um, easier thing to, to measure uh, or to, to respond to. Yes, there are plans starting from the policy objective to, um, the policy objective identifies cyber capacity um, development for law enforcement and the judiciary. And to this extent, um, there are actually um, programs um, some of these programs have already been executed and some are on a rolling basis. So you have um, and, and some we've done from the Ministry of Justice, some we've done in conjunction with, uh, develop, uh, with partners like the Glacier Plus project of the Council of Europe. Um, so we've had training for judges at the introductory level, the intermediate level, and the advanced level. So basically, what that program entails is that judges who do the first course take the follow-on intermediate level course and then go on to do the um, advanced level course. 
so the bottom line really is that having recognized the importance of capacity building, particularly for the judiciary, and this, some of these trainings are done with respect not just the law itself, but also um, uh, the, the subject matters of electronic evidence, digital forensics, and how they impact the adjudication in, 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 um, of, 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 of these cases when they come up. Uh, but the key thing is that it is a continuing program. So on a yearly basis, these programs are run from the introductory to the, ad, um, to the advanced level courses. And there are also times when we partner with other stakeholders, including civil society, to also um, highlight things like um, the importance of digital rights in the course of adjudication. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yes, yeah. Thank you so much, sir. And now, I feel like the uh, yes, thank you so much, Mr. Jonathan. <laughs> thank you. And now, the next thank question you. is to Chief Anthony Debay. Can you shed some light on how the private sector can support the government regarding adherence to global best practices and sharing of cybersecurity legal frameworks? Thank you so much, Essie. You're um, welcome. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think the private sector has a lot of role to play. Um, and I think that the um, uh, first role that they have to play is uh, voluntary compliance. Um, the private sector need doesn't. The, the truth is that um, uh, we suffer the most uh, if there is um, a breach of um, cyber security, and so we really don't need the government uh, to carry a cane to flog us into compliance. So there should be a high level of uh, voluntary compliance. Uh, in fact. The private sector should lead the way through organization of themselves uh, to be able to then do the standard setting. They should be setting the standard, uh, really, and then the government will just um, follow through. Uh, in addition, uh, really, to be able to combat um, uh, cyber security or cyber crimes, um, you need information sharing. And what usually what happens in the private sector is uh, those who have been subject of attack keep quiet. So they don't share the knowledge and the system doesn't um, uh, know and cannot respond and the government is not able to respond appropriately. So information sharing is very important. And in many societies, uh, what they have done is voluntarily they've set up um, uh, associations where they share data. So if you if there's an attack, you report, and then you say how it happened, and people learn uh, from that, and then start new standards uh, are set uh, from that. Um, also, uh, the private sector uh, needs to uh, uh, continue to drive the technology, um, just like um, uh, Bukola said, to, to drive the technology to provide the support for uh, the government uh, and the solutions to the problem uh, and then lastly i think that a lot of private sector uh, should be concerned about their vendor procurement process to ensure they have robust vendor uh, procurement uh, uh, process because a lot of, um, like you take the digital uh, the devices, um, you know, if there's, if, if there's an intervention at the cheap manufacturing level, right, then some, somebody is going to have access to all the devices that carry that chip. So the vendor procurement process is very critical to ensure that um, uh, it's robust and, and therefore that um, you can stop it, you know, as the private sector when you are manufacturing your own products. And, and then there should be frequent review of your processes. Frequent review is so important uh, because the standards change, the techniques change, so you have to have a process by which you review your uh, system and of course if you are part of a voluntary organization and you set industry standards and you share information then that review that frequent review will be useful to you in the private sector thank you very much thank you very very much sir we're very very grateful for that 
And so I'd just like to direct our last question for today to Mr. Emmanuel Edit. The African Continental Free Trade Area, AFC, FTA represents a major opportunity for African countries to bring 30 million people out of extreme poverty and to raise the incomes of 68 million others who live on less than $5.50 per day. With implementation of AFC FTA trade, facilitation measures that cut red tape and simplify customs procedures would drive $292 billion of the $450 billion in potential income gains. Now, seeing that Nigeria is signed on to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, how does the nation's position on data localization impact this? Over to you, Mr. Um, Edit. Um, thank you very much, Esther. I can hear you. Um, let me just run through that. Uh, again, I, I think we need to understand when we are talking about data localization, like I mentioned before, um, what really are we localizing? Are we saying that um, because we are localizing data as it is so called- Can everyone else hear him? Yes. yes. Thank yes. you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, see. Um, I think you can't hear me, but because we are localizing data, doesn't mean people, um, the, uh, what should I call it? People who want to do business cannot have access to data. Let us understand one thing. As far as international commerce is concerned, um, we, Nigeria does not in any way prevent international content, um, commerce and, uh, should I call it, transactions, simply because the data that is available for Nigerians are not available to other people to carry out businesses and trade. In fact, because of the activities of the National Identity Management Commission, it is now easier to identify a Nigerian to actually carry out business. So the issue now would be, how far has Nigeria, Niger, the Nigerian government actually gone in order to promote the Africa free trade area, Africa continental free trade area? I would say a lot. Honorable Jha mentioned the fact that these laws have been localized in Nigeria, they've been domesticated so that we can have the full benefit of it. Um, so in a nutshell, data localization, I know we have little time left. So data localization does not in any way affect those type of international transaction. People still carry out their transaction. In fact, it's easier to identify someone to carry out transaction at this particular time because of the improved identity management that has happened in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, sir. And I um, would like to round this off. I'll just give a short summary of some of the things we've discussed here today. The need for data privacy cannot be ignored, yet there are costly risks to a nation's economy when the flow of data across borders is restricted, such as um, a loss in investment, total outputs. A possible solution for gaining a middle ground is to create constructive alternatives. Laws need to be updated regularly to strengthen cybersecurity and capacity, capacity needs to be built in this area. A uh, collaboration between the government and the private sector would enhance these. And that is why we have conferences like what we just had today. And so I would like to thank everyone. Thank you so much, sirs, for joining us. We are grateful to all our participants and believe that insights gained here will improve measures to strengthen cybersecurity. On behalf of the American Business Council, and partners of this conference, I'd like to say again, thank you so much and goodbye. The session on the theme, promoting a thriving digital economy, capacity building and cyber awareness. My name is Victoria Manya, and I lead the advocacy for policy and innovation API as the executive director. Today, we have a lineup of excellent minds with the requisite knowledge on this thematic area of focus. Gracing the panel, just a little bit of introductions, gracing the panel from within the fabrics of academia is an astute professor of information systems, Professor Olainka David West, the associate dean at the Lagos Business School. You are most welcome, Prof. Next, we have Dr. Haru Al Hassan, gracefully straddling his experience in academia and public service. He is the director new media and information security at the, at the Nigerian Communications Commission. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. 
Thank on the you, panel Victoria. also, on the panel also is the quick witted Richard Archdeacon, the advisory chief information security officer, Europe, Middle East, and Africa for Dual Security Cisco. Thanks for joining us, Richard. We also have with us John Anyamu, partner head, partner and head, cyber and privacy advisory services, KPMG Nigeria. He's also the lead for the KPMG Africa cyber team. Thank you for being here, sir. Next with us today is the head of Microsoft Cybersecurity Public Sector Team in the Middle East and Africa, Aidan Aslana. Aidan, thank you for participating in this session. Thank you. We have with us on the panel Abbasambo Usman, the head of Cyber Crimes Unit at the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. Thank you for being here, sir. It's a, pleasure. a little bit of housekeeping. Please ensure to use the chat function. Um, Any time to indicate a question or a comment for either of the panelists, and we'll get to them in due course. For our first round of questions, we'll begin with Dr. Al Hassan to set the tone for the conversation. Sir, yeah. telecommunications tools have aided digitalization over distance and has primarily reduced the cross continental gaps and digital divide. Now, within the global scheme of digital integrations, Nigeria has caught on to the benefits of the cyberspace through the digital economy. Yeah. The, but however, this uh, has come as a surprise, as we're all aware. It, it, it has come with the cyber security challenges. How is the government engaging this rather complex dynamic to enable the economic benefits of digitalization side by side, reducing the negative impact of cyber security or cyber crimes on genuine users okay actually um first uh, can you go straight uh, repeat the question please i did not understand okay sir. hello yeah yes can you hear us how is the government engaging yeah. the rather complex dynamics to enable the economic benefits of digitalization side by side, the challenges we are experiencing with cyber security in Nigeria? Okay, actually, um, uh, noting that the issue of uh, cyber security um, requires a collaborative uh, effort and response in line with national cyber security policy and strategy. The Nigerian Communication Commission is working to establish a uh, one that is a uh, computer security incidents response team, CSAT, uh, that will support what other agencies that is that will co uh, will work in hands with other sectorial SATs uh, in the country um, um, to stem the menace of the cyber crime, of which hacking is one of them. Then the NCC SAT, when fully when, when fully operational will facilitate intervention, swift identification of threats, uh, vulnerabilities, and the sharing of value information and resources to assist in fortifying the resilience of the national ICT infrastructure. Uh, we are also working to intensify cyber security awareness using all available media platforms and the content types uh, to disseminate information on how to stay safe online, with particular focus on vulnerable, um, such as minors and uh, old age. The Commission is also working to establish a minimum cyber security guideline that will ensure that all telecommunication service providers put in place uh, security standards that will provide and safeguard for critical telecommunication infrastructure for, uh, in the country. Thank you. Thank you so much, you. sir. That was an insightful yes. um, take yes. currently doing, and it gives us yes. um, a basic, uh, or the basic context that we need to delve into more nuanced conversations. We go on to um, ABBA from the EFCC. Um, with the cyber crimes like phishing scams, internet frauds, online intellectual property infringement, identity theft, you know, going by everything um, Dr. Haru has mentioned, 
what are the challenges in optimizing the economic benefits of the cyberspace with this rather dangerous trend? Speaking from your expertise and uh, working with the EFCC. Um, from our experience, um, the Nigerian cyberspace has evolved. The threat actors were initially um, script killers with little computing knowledge, but now the um, level of sophistication has grown greatly. They usually start from the form of crime uh, involving romance scam, and now they have graduated to business email compromise that requires a lot of uh, um, um, technical skill and brings in the highest return. The biggest challenge uh, relating to these type of crimes is it um, takes away trust. Uh, all um, um, e-commerce platforms that the digital economy thrives upon rely on trust. If people don't trust them, then it creates a situation in which people don't patronize them. Those diminishing their, their value. And the um, increase in the number of youth participating, or uh, participating in these type of crimes has created a situation in which a lot of them see it as a form of trade. They, um, they go through a process of apprenticeship just like the normal people do when they go to learn trade, and then they graduate. When they graduate, become more sophisticated, they provide other services to um, um, younger um, um, criminals in the form of um, um, helping them in receiving the proceeds of their criminal activities. So when you have issue of lack of trust and issue of increase in the number of people perpetrating these type of crimes, it creates a situation in which the common man that is meant to use these platforms um, um, is um, denied the chance to do that. So it's really a challenge. And part of the challenge is the issue of lack of capacity, which perhaps we may talk about later in the program, lack of capacity for um, law enforcement agencies to really address these problems. The first responders when these type of crimes take place are the Nigerian police. When you go to the Nigerian police, and explain to them that these type of crimes have taken place. They don't even understand it to the beginning. Let alone them trying to um, know how to handle it. Issue of lack of um, forensic capability, all those things uh, bring into the mix a situation in which people don't have confidence or trust in these uh, um, uh, platforms. And a lot needs to be done um, in order to ensure that the trust is built and the systems are strengthened to ensure yes. that Mona didn't participate in the uh, take advantage of these platforms. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, sir. Um, that was a very good take on that question. And it scares me a bit, but I'll move on to Prof. Prof, it seems like we have our work cut out for us. So why if everything that um, Abba has explained seems to be an imminent threat to every Nigerian um, down to the most vulnerable, we should be aware, we should be prepared, right? But why is cybersecurity still a going concern? Now they are moving on to sophistication, um, ABBA mentioned apprenticeship. So it's big, it's an ecosystem basically, right? Would you say many Nigerians are unaware of the impact of cybersecurity, hence its growth, right? And in what areas are players within the digital economy falling victims to cyber attacks? Okay. Th thank you, Victoria. And thanks for the bundled question, but I'll try to answer it in pieces. I think the first thing is that why is cyber growing? You know, I, I have three sort of main reasons. The first is there's a social dilemma of unemployment and underemployment, and people still need decent work and livelihood so they can survive and continue to exist. And what they'll do is that they'll they'll be soon they'll be thrown into some of these apprenticeship schemes that um, Abba described and mentioned. The second is the area of um, there's a, an increasing number of technology devices in the marketplace today. And when you look at the numbers that um, the NCC sites in terms of we now just not we don't just have computers we also have mobile telephones and mobile devices we have Internet of Things and sensors all devices connected and working together and basically adding more vulnerabilities to the power of God knows how much okay and then on the third side as well we saw COVID as an enabler of digital transformation. So that also meant that the usage increased significantly. 
And when that usage increased significantly, we all, all our lives, our business lives, our financial lives, as well as our information flows, we're all digital. So, the, so we basically gave them more content to mine and to filter through and to use against us in that sense. So th those are some of the three reasons why we see the growth in cyber. But then again, would we say Nigerians are unaware? Well, in my role as a teacher and teaching business managers who are also educated, right? Yes, there is a problem in awareness in general. And I think that it's almost like we're giving people tools, but not necessarily the requisite education to use those tools in a responsible manner. And I'm using the word responsible because the responsibility is on everybody's side. We all have roles to play in ensuring that we build a responsible internet and safe environment that endears trust, that we can continue doing things online. So to what, you know, there's also the issue about sometimes we want to be responsible, but we honestly can't afford to be responsible because some of these in implementations cost a lot of money. So when we are still struggling with, oh, what's the cost of buying the infrastructure? We haven't looked at the total cost of ownership in terms of protecting and securing the infrastructure in that sense. And then Abba also spoke about competence and knowledge, right? We need competence and knowledge because with every new technology, there are vulnerabilities. There's the, I say there's the good, the bad, and the ugly. So where do you draw the line? Because sometimes we only focus on the good side and we don't look at some of the other issues. But generally, as a business, cyber is a business risk and businesses, even up to board level, need to make it a conversation topic because we've seen some of the challenges and issues regarding fines and compliance fines. And we were both with GDPR and all sorts of other things or ransomware. So we need to take it a bit more seriously and again, put our investment where it's needed and maybe sometimes go away from the hope and like, oh, it, it wouldn't be my turn. It's not my portion and things like that. So I think that as businesses, we need to really be aware of the risks of what we're doing and understand the full picture. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Prof. Even I have learned a lot in a few minutes. Thank you for answering that question with so much succinctness. Um, Aiden, we'll come to you now. Prof and the other speakers have captured the problem of competence, you know, the challenges that came with COVID, and even generally digitalization itself. Now, cybersecurity requires balancing data, information sharing with data protection, confidentiality, integrity. You know, this is a rather complicated intersection with enormous expectations. So what are the strategies you would consider as best for emerging markets like Nigeria in protecting its cyberspace without compromising the ease of doing business and infringing on the rights of its citizens? Uh, thanks, Victoria. That's a great question. Uh, look, I think um, having worked with uh, multiple governments in the region uh, across the African continent as well as um, elsewhere, uh, I think building a cyber defense strategy all up for the for a country to protect the citizens is a must have. And I'm sure Nigeria is already doing that, uh, is in the motion, but getting that support as well from external, all the vendors that are here on the call and also, you know, they're experts in the, um, in the, in the area is very important. It's because it, cyber crime or cyber business, cyber security, and I call it cyber business intentionally, it's because it, it is a business model, right? Um, the earlier speakers have mentioned, you know, you can easily go ahead and, you know, purchase any type of attack you want at the, at the dark uh, web at any point. And um, it's not only limited to those, you know, old script kiddies, as was mentioned earlier, it's, it's also beyond that. You have nation state actors that are attacking other nations uh, that are trying to bring down critical infrastructure, which we have seen over the last six months, multiple times um, impacting, uh, you know, complete cities uh, or, or complete countries. So um, it is an evolving business that is changing rapidly. Uh, and we have to find new ways um, as they find new ways to protect our citizens, our countries, and our people, basically. So um, building that strategy um, is, is probably um, and building that strategy, and the way we look at it in the industry, and I'm sure uh, you know others in the call will agree, uh, you know, it's been going around for a while, uh, is to have a zero, zero trust strategy, which is around you know verifying explicitly who is doing what, um, and not just trusting someone just because we know them, uh, giving them privilege at all at all times 
so not everyone requires access to everything at any point. And making sure that you know you have that assumed breach mindset. Meaning for us, you know, we're all breached, but we just don't know about it. Yeah. So yeah. if we start with those three basic points to build a strategy around how we're gonna, you know, evolve the uh, the cyber uh, posture of a country uh, and protect the citizens, that's a good starting point. And then the second piece I'm gonna mention, if I may, is um, you know, working with the governments, um, like Microsoft has a program called the Government Security Program. Within that program, what we do is we, uh, and this is just, you know, with selected governments, telemetry data with those governments in order to protect the country. So it's a country-based uh, uh, data points that we share uh, with, typically with the regulators and the certs that, and uh, we also work with the law enforcement, of course, in the countries. Um, and it helps really to get that visibility into what's happening within that country uh, in terms of cyber activities. Uh, and that's based on the about 8 trillion signals that we collect um, throughout our services that we what we provide. Uh, and there are similar offerings, I'm sure, from other vendors as well. But it's not only about the offer, it's about that that insight that you gain at the country level, uh, and it will help you, uh, the government, uh, to protect the citizens. So I think that's a, I think, a very good starting point to look into this, um, rather than going into deep dive into double clicking into the, into the details of it. Yes. Thank you so much, Aiden. I hear you. Insight. We all need insight of what we are dealing with to know how to deal with it. Thank you so much. Now we move to you, John. Everyone has spoken about um, trust. Others have spoken about insight. We come to the question of fake news. You know, um, Aiden mentioned something really important. He said, you do not believe something. You shouldn't believe something merely because you know who posted it, right? And every one of us here must have had a contact on social media who has one time at least posted news that was fake and verified as fake afterwards, right? John, what are the best options to combat fake news in Nigeria? How do we enforce accountability and demand responsibility from peddlers? Yeah, thank you very much, Victoria. And um, once again, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I think, you know, the reality is that in the past couple of years, um, there has been that um, glamorization of fake news. You know, there has always been fake news, but I think we've seen how um, very pragmatic, you know, the social media is to achieving general of, you know, public influence. And, and I think that's really where fake news then becomes a, a major area of worry. So it's important to curb fake news. Um, there have been, you know, there are threats to, to public health, threats to public security. I mean, there are all sorts of emergencies that arise due to fake news. We can't yeah. take our eyes off that. So, and for the sovereign, for the government, you want to protect your citizens um, from these public risks. Um, so it's necessary to, to curb the spread of misinformation. Um, I was reading somewhere there's a difference between misinformation and disinformation. Disinformation is deliberate. Misinformation might be, you know, just someone doing something ignorantly. So regardless, um, you want to curb that spread of information that is not factual. Um, there, there's a flip side to this, of course. Um, you know, while there is, you have to bring in the efforts to counter fake news, you have to know when you, you, you cross the line of suppressing those critical thoughts, those critical facts that help the public to make informed decisions. So you have to know how to balance it. So, and the truth is that it remains a sensitive issue. Um, governments and social media platforms are collaborating across the world in this area. And I think as a country, we have to engage, we have to join that collaboration effort. Um, there are a number of points that one can can link up to, you know, over and above collaboration. Number one is digital literacy. People need to be more literate from a digital standpoint. And sometimes digital literacy might not be, as, as Aiden said, being able to click and double click. It might just be knowing that not all information is safe and factual. Um, so that level of digital lit literacy is key. Um, also cyber awareness. Um, I, I focus a lot on cyber security and I know that one of the, you know, the, one of the key, um, we, we call them uh, TTPs or, or attack vectors of cyber security professionals is leveraging fake news. What we call social engineering is really, you know, just turning, you know, just weaponizing fake news essentially. So cyber awareness programs help, you know, um, they help people to know when they are being exposed in that manner. 
I think there is need for more technical support from the social media and the tech companies. Aiden has spoken about how Microsoft is providing that support to, to some nationals just based on the wealth and the, the breadth of data that you're exposed to and how much you can do with, with that. Form. So that, that technical support is key. And I use the word technical support loosely, but simply as simple as flagging a tweet or flagging a post on Instagram to say, yeah. this is not verified. Something as simple as, you know, responding when people say, um, you know, there's some level of unconscious bias in this post. Just things like that, are, you know, those are the kind of supports that the, the tech companies can provide. And perhaps they can even include more functionalities that can enable enforcement of, of the law. That And that brings me to my last point on this. I know there are a number of other questions, so I wouldn't, okay. um, you know, I won't use up all my points now. But I think enforcing the law is key. You know, you have to be able to, how do you enforce the law against those that put out fake news? You know, those that, that send out particularly disinformation because there are those that are weaponizing it. How are you able to identify them and charge them? So... I think in terms of identifying, tracing, tracking, and all the forensics around it, the tech companies can help. I know that there are some there is a, there is a gray area around data privacy, but I'm sure that there are some level of um, collaborative efforts that can be achieved, particularly where public health and public security is concerned. Um, then on the side of the enforcers of the law, um, the, the the government, they then need to enforce the law. And I, I watched. Uh, I'm, I'm a fan of. Um, the English Premiership, and I see where you know um, fans are, you know, you know, just by virtue of identifying their posts, they are banned from watching matches, and they even take it further to, you know, to charging them to court, as, as the case may be. So I think those deliberate efforts, as few as they may be, um, will build a lot of trust in the public, and then that level of awareness as well. Yeah. So that, that's my Thank point you. here, Victoria. I'll I'll save the rest the rest for for other questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, that was insightful. And um, I hear your point on collaboration. You know, the citizens also have a role to play, digital literacy, cyber awareness, which brings us to the question we have for Richard today. Richard, we have over 187 million mobile um, connections, 33 million social media users, 104 million internet users um, according to statistics now there's a perception that the internet is easy to use you know and Aiden touched on that point John as well touched on that point we all believe if we click we're able to click and narrow our way through then we can use the internet but cyber crime is burgeoning and it is proving us otherwise is there a space for learning to use social media appropriately? Do we as citizens need capacity building programs? Thank you, Victoria, for, the, for that question. And I, I think I'd like to break down the answer into three elements, the issue, the, okay. the appropriateness side, and also the capacity building side. I should say I come from a very practical point of view. I want to know how we can fix things, having implemented big security programs, and also seeing it from the government point of view, having worked with the uh, UK Cabinet Office. Um, obviously, there's a huge issue already, and as I think Professor David West mentioned, there's an increasing use of the internet. And I did some really interesting research some years ago in Europe, where as each European country rolled out broadband, so the phishing attacks rose. There was a direct correlation. So we have to expect that as these new initiatives take, take off. So um, the reason I, I try to look at it from the appropriateness and the capacity point of view is appropriate use of the internet and social media is very critical. Why? Well, I'm going to step back a bit and look at the attacker. And there's a, a method of describing attacks called the kill chain, uh, which came out from Lockheed Martin. And the first step is reconnaissance, finding the information. And why is it important we understand what to put up there on, on social media? And I'll give you a practical example. Some years ago, working with a bank, we went to speak to them and one of my security people had gone on to technology forums and their person from the bank had said, we're doing this with this piece of software, we're having this problem on this platform, what do we do? So immediately the, the attackers would know how to attack into that organization. So, so appropriateness, what to put up on the bank, how to, to put it up there, sorry, on social media, what to mention, and that applies to consumers you know, ordinary individual citizens as well as organizations. So we have to think the whole time of these two elements. There's the, the, the business side and the, um, the user side. And I think 
uh, they, Wes mentioned the idea of risk to businesses. What is the risk of putting this information out there? So I think that appropriateness fits into the reconnaissance stage of the attack they map against them. Now, what about the capacity building programs? And again, I would divide those into two, into um, the business side and the user side. And on the business side, again, it's the risk side, the fact that you have to spend money on this. Just because nothing's happened doesn't mean to say you don't have to spend money. It will happen at some stage. So I think we have to get that awareness across. And also to the users, when you're on the internet, when you're looking at social media, whatever, there's some very basic steps we could do. So we could build up the user's capacity to defend themselves and two simple steps they could take. One is let's try and get the message across. And I know later we'll be talking about how we might build this capacity. Um, first of all, wherever you are, this is business or user, put in something as simple as, as multi-factor authentication and password managers. Very simple, practical steps. And why do I choose them? Because all the statistics show you, show you that 70 to 80% of the attacks come through that front door. So let's just take some practical steps. And what are we doing? We're building the user capacity to defend themselves. We're building the we're building up the business capacity to defend themselves. So as I think the US ambassador said they could be reactive, not proactive. We're being reactive, we're getting up ahead of the game. And again, to repeat what the minister said, this is everybody's business. So let's yeah. try and make sure everybody's aware and give them simple things that they can do which will protect themselves. Yeah. Thank you so much, Richard. Speaking of everybody's business, um, three of our speakers have mentioned the intermediary's responsibility. But now Richard has just averted to the um, point on authentic authentication, right? The multi-factor authentication. Yeah, um, I know I do that on Facebook uh, because my account has been, uh, or an attempt has been uh, made on my account severally, right? So, and I also see that Facebook sends me messages or mails to say, were you the one trying to sign into your account from this region? If it isn't, then um, do this or that. So there are practical steps that intermediaries have put in place, but who still think they, they should do more? So for Aiden, this question is, is there a gap left by social media platforms in Nigeria in developing economies um, as it regards social media? And it's so I'll take it a little bit further and only not, not limited to social media, because I think, um, you know, we as, for instance, as a cloud service provider, uh, we inherit two things when we onboard any customer to the platform. One, it's a simple one. If the customer is you know, in a regulated environment where they have to comply with some regulations, we inherit that automatically. So a customer joining Microsoft's platform means for us that we have to make sure that the customer is compliant. That's mm -hmm. not a big issue. I mean, that's something we deal with. The mm -hmm. second piece that we inherit is the uh, ad adversaries that this customer is actually being attacked by. So mm -hmm. it's not only then the customer being attacked, it's the Microsoft platform who is being attacked. So we take that seriously because that's where we a um, you know learn from. We enhance our services and our products, but also give back that information to the customer, right? So when you talk about you know social media or any other platform, it, it, I don't see it any any different way, right? Um, I mm -hmm. think Richard is spot on with multi-factor authentication being mm -hmm. probably the number one suggestion that we any security information security person would say, mm -hmm. uh, you know, along with good email hygiene uh, patching. Mm -hmm. Uh, segmentation, limiting the access, all of these things are, I think, the first couple of steps that I would also suggest. Mm -hmm. You know, being, I think I'll come back to what the prof said. Uh, and, you know, I'm thinking a little bit from a teacher perspective, as, as she probably she does as well. I look at my kids, right? Um, I look at how they actually engage on social media. I, I try to, you know, teach them, educate them on very at very early age on what they should and what they should not share. One of the things I told them, and uh, it's something in the practice that they're keeping on, I said, whatever you post is not only posted once. It's posted now and it's gone. Now you cannot undo that anymore because it's on someone's device, on someone's computer, and someone will take it and do something with it which you don't want. So try to step back from that step, right? So that, it's not so that early. And then you build up that capacity and that skilling early enough so that you know, as they grow, they get more awareness and they be more cautious about what they share or not, with whom, at what point, and be very, very, you know, um, I'll say smart about their steps, right, as kids. And then when you look at the business side, of course, it's important that we continue to do that education to our users, to our end users, 
Um, and on the professional side, I think the skilling piece uh, is very, very important. We have, you know, we have, I think Microsoft and other vendors multiple times, we've created academies, skilling initiatives to really ramp up the skills in a country, um, specifically on cybersecurity. I'll give you one last example. Um, about a year and a half ago, I was engaged to build a cybersecurity academy in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, actually, um, in Belfast, uh, because we really identified that as a hub for us to build that capacity. And I'm sure we have multiple other uh, you know, areas where we're building some, similar, something similar. And I think that is a crucial part because there's a huge skills gap still in the industry when it comes to cybersecurity. So I'll pause here and uh, leave it there. Thank you, Aiden. I hear you. The huge skills gap when it comes to cybersecurity is something we're still um, trying to grapple here in Nigeria. John alluded to it, Prof as well, and even Abba um, from the EFCC also mentioned. Now, Prof, Aiden brought us back to our individual responsibilities, right? So for you, would you explain to us what we can do to protect ourselves online as individuals. You have been an advocate for the safe side cyber space for a long time. And I know I've heard you um, give certain very innovative um, suggestions on how we can protect ourselves. Is there a role for the government alone or are there opportunities for multi-stakeholder collaborations as uh, mentioned by previous speakers? Okay. Th thanks, Victoria. And I think that we've all gathered in this conversation that they, this is a stakeholder approach and everyone has a role to play. And I think the other thing I want to highlight is um, advocating for a safe cyberspace doesn't mean we're going to sanitize cyberspace and that everything is going to be A-OK. -okay. It's a continuous battle. It's something that we need to con do every single day because I think what one thing Abba mentioned is that, see, where we don't want to collaborate, the cyber criminals are collaborating. collaborating yes. So we have to be mindful that, you know, the effort of all of us learning together, working together to, to defend ourselves collectively is only the only thing that's going to get us there. So how do we do this? And I think that this is where across institutions, we also need to work. We need to share the right data because you can, you can only do something when you know, not maybe three days after, and you're also vulnerable. You know, and I think Aiden mentioned this issue about, you know, there's zero trust strategy. I believe that sometimes there's TMI, you know, we're telling too many people everything about ourselves, right? Yes, you do, but you don't know who you're speaking with. So it's almost like when you were growing up and they said, don't talk to strangers. We need to put that mindset back on back home, when we're yeah. online and be guarded about what you're saying, both as organizations, as well as individuals in general. So for example, one thing we also need to be mindful of with organizations is this issue about um, education and skilling, and even the tools that we buy, how we filter in content, how we monitoring things that are happening, because we not all of us have proper information man systems management. So we don't even know what versions of products we're running, what people are downloading and things like that. So the vulnerabilities are increasing by the, by the thousands every day. And then also, how do we train people to your sort of even recognize compromised communications? I remember many years ago in the days of, you know, email compromise and malware, it was always nice messages at holiday times. Oh, some, uh, some Santa dancing and everyone clicks on it and shares it and forwards it. And there you had the explosion. So when we, you know, so those are the things that we need to be mindful of. It's not that, yes, there's communication, there's uh, protections, but we can't switch off our safety hats and then just sort of think that we're safe in that cyber environment. I believe we need to be mindful, we need to be guarded, and we need to realize that not everybody is your friend. Yeah. You know, and that's the, that's the bottom line. So I'll stop there and let my other colleagues uh, <laughs> chime in on this conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Cybersecurity is not a blanket um, um, or a magic wand that will take away all the problems at once. I hear you. It's a progressive uh, and a continuous effort. Um, we have a question for John, but added to um, what Prof has said, I would like to go to Dr. Al Hassan first. Um, should we all be cyber defenders as citizens? 
how do we prepare, prevent, detect, and respond to a cyber attack without professional training? Other speakers have indicated that there is a need. Um, Richard even went on to give us two points um, that are instructive on how we should engage on social media. Now, call it cyber security first aid. Should this be taught to everyone? Aiden is teaching his children. Should we all be learning this in Nigeria? Um, please, uh, uh, Dr. Haru al as you said. Honestly speaking, uh, it's necessary. Cyber education and uh, what is called cyber hygiene is supposed to be taught right from uh, elementary schools uh, down to tertiary institutions. It's necessary to teach uh, the basic cyber skills and um, also um, awareness is necessary. That is uh, what I said last, uh, the LCC is doing, is embarking on awareness. Uh, we may, um, Nigerian uh, mobile users start receiving text messages. Uh, I don't know whether you start receiving such text messages which are called cyber aware, which mm -hmm. uh, will guide the users and um, on little basis they can protect themselves. Yeah. Uh, it's necessary, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Then Thank there, you there are other, okay. Okay, there, is, there are also other issues of uh, uh, like the way it was mentioned, what type of devices are used, how to configure our devices, how to um, especially how to update or update the software update and so on. Those are very little things, but they are, they are very important uh, that can prevent us from hiking. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Doctor. And we'll move on to Richard because um, your question is also tied to um, the question that um, Dr. Al Hassan has just responded to. Uh, the would we is it possible to have capacity building of this magnitude in Nigeria? There are many of us, and how do we even track its effectiveness? How do we get people to be interested in this capacity building? Generally, is it practical? Um, thank you, Victoria. I think not only is it practical, but it's necessary. So we have to tackle it and, and we have to start somewhere and continue the working on it. And I, I note what Dr. Al Hassan said about the, the, the government starting to put uh, uh, awareness through all levels of education. And that's a very important first point. Um, in terms of the users, I think there's a great opportunity for businesses to work with their employees. So a business will be, uh, instead of just saying you've got to be aware at work, that you've got to be aware at home as well. So you can have that joint joint um, uh, effort there. There's a huge technical capacity building requirement, and that will be done through academia, um, as well as through online training. And now that's become a very important uh, way to increase resources. I would just say that every single country in the world and every single CISO I speak to has said their main problem is shortage of resources. So this is something we have to keep on the that that will happen. Um, and I think that one aspect of the, the technology side which brings together the users is very important is that a lot of the security solutions have now been delivered from the cloud, as we say, so that um, you don't have to, if you're a small business, you don't have to go and buy boxes and install them and so forth. You can just have cloud delivered security. So I think we have to make people aware of that and that will become very useful for them and it will help relieve that technology shortage. But there's still be a huge shortage. And finally, I've seen very great initiatives from governments about trying to build up this awareness. And I think Dr. Al Hassan mentioned of that, but also development in places like the Netherlands and the UK of schemes such as Cyber Essentials, which says to business, these are the basic five things you should have before you, you work with us. So building practical solutions around that. So it's connecting all of those different <coughs> And working together you know, it's everybody's business so it's a very quick quick overview yes thank you so much richard practical solutions are really what we need right now um abba you have seen these things i would dare to say you have seen it all working with the afcc what is your take on capacity building programs for citizens uh, to use or with the use of cyberspace are we chasing shadows or at best a utopian approach? I'm asking these questions because even with all the efforts and the warnings we get, you know, every day, people still fall victims to this cyber attacks. So would you say we are just chasing shadows in trying to build the capacity of Nigerians? No, uh, we are not chasing shadows. 
we have made remarkable impact. Now, if you look at um, what's happening to the threat actors, the cyber criminals in Nigeria, they are becoming more desperate mm. because the pool of victims is gradually diminishing as a result of these awareness campaigns that we have embarked on. Now, how do we know this? You find a lot of them resorting to use of um, juju and other fetish means in order to defraud their victims. Ordinarily, it wasn't like that. But now they're becoming more desperate because people are more aware. So they need, in, from their own perspective, they need to use some form of um, supernatural power to perhaps um, get the victim to, 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 to part with his money. And as part of this, there is a whole new industry of what is called the Yahoo Plus. Mm. So it's the uh, Yahoo plus some form of magic or some form of juju that is intertwined in order for the, um, um, the cyber criminal to, to succeed. Many of the arrests we have uh, conducted, we found out that searches are executed. Fetish items are recovered from the houses and the premises of the cyber criminals. Now, so, um, um, building capacity is necessary. From our perspective, I think the capacity needs to be built around um, three areas. The first one is the issue of the businesses. The businesses, the ones that um, um, develop the, um, um, the infrastructure, infrastructure need to uh, be made aware of the need to ensure that the systems that they build are resilient and robust so that these um, actors do not have the opportunity or have the minimal active, uh, opportunity to take advantage of them. And the users too. There has to be a lot of awareness. Now, um, the EOCC on its part has conducted a lot of awareness campaign of Facebook and other social media. We have taken it to schools. We have taken it to uh, the, uh, the print media, the radio and television in order to create awareness in people. I know the Central Bank under the, uh, the Nigerian Electronic uh, Fraud Forum to under the auspices of the Central Bank and Nigerian banks have done a lot, a lot in trying to create awareness so that people don't fall victim to this type of um, uh, um, um, activities. On the part of law enforcement agencies, there is equally the need for the capacity to be built so that they will be able to respond and appropriately um, 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 investigate these kind of uh, offenses. As we know, electronic evidence is really um, volatile. It can easily be um, destroyed and if it's not handled properly, it's not admissible yeah. before a court of law. So this, the law enforcement too needs capacity building around this area so that when they prosecute these cases, um, successful conviction is uh, secured, without which the proper example may not necessarily be set as deterrent to be, um, will be perpetrators. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abba. Uh, with Yahoo Plus, the resource constraints, John, we come back to you. All of this have um, garnered us a global, would I say, or, or there is a You know, with the, with the cyber crime resume for Nigeria, right? As a collective reputation. As a matter of fact, I was checking for accommodation a couple of months ago. Um, and one of the government sites in the country where I was searching for accommodation indicated beware of the Nigerian prince, right? So these things follow us everywhere we go. But we also need the benefits to the digital economy. How can we rebuild the digital image of Nigeria within the regulatory without stifling innovation and digital exploration? Thank you very much, uh, Victoria, and uh, very good points. You know, um, I think to start with, there's a brand building angle to this conversation. Um, the challenge is that we have a lot of positive stories about Nigeria that are not making but they are not out there. So they make the stories of cybercrime get significant attention. We can't take that away. I mean, there are publications that show um, countries that are ranked higher than Nigeria in quantity and value of cybercrime, who don't even get as much media attention as we do in Nigeria. Um, that, that fact we have to hold on one hand, right? I mean, in the spirit of um, avoiding disinformation and disinformation, okay? Um, having said that, you know, we shouldn't also make light the issue. You know, there's an issue at hand, uh, and that's the issue that... Um, so some of these... I mean, these few stories are factual. Some of yes. them are bizarre, so very, wor mm -hmm. very worrisome. So, 
you, you, you need to know about that. So I think from my own side, I've, I've mentioned a few points in my previous um, response yeah. around regulation, around collaboration. But I think in addition, we need strategies that are geared towards capacity building, um, geared towards channeling human capital to be, to be more productive, um, you know, true more productive endeavors. And I know the professor, the prof mentioned that, you know, people are sometimes going to cybercrime because it's glamorous and they seem, it seems as if it outweighs the risk. But when yes. there is so much, um, you know, when there's so much cyber education um, artifacts out there that are easily accessible to people, you will find them developing those skills. And when you get it towards, um, you know, productive use, it helps. Um, the other point I want to mention is that we need to start looking at, there are a number of startups that are geared towards projecting Nigeria's technical capital on the world stage. We have a lot of yes. very smart people. Um, yes. it, it will help if there are such, um, if there is that framework or institutions within government, which can be projected, you know, and I know some countries do that. There are some yes. offices that provide legal advice, finance advice, risk awareness, capacity mm -hmm. building to these startups so that they focus on their core business, knowing yes. that some of those other areas have already been catered for. That's one point that I can I can say we need to consider, you know, in addition to all the other points, what yeah. support can we provide to these people? Um, and it doesn't have to be highly skilled. You, you can, as yes. far as it is strong and competent and the awareness is there, these people with the ideas will come to you knowing that you will give them, you will point them in the right direction and help to sort of enhance that ecosystem. If we're well projected in the global, in the global you know village you know then they will get to know more about the positive things we're doing and that will yes. help to project our brand you know you have to project your brand yes. on productive yes. things right so that, that's yes. my own yes. thoughts around that yes Thanks, thank Victoria. you so much john thank you so much if we do not project our brand no one will especially the good part uh, but bad news spreads really fast like wildfire prof um has some i've had a conversation with prof in uh, previous conversations on um cyber security and we've spoken about regulations over and over again prof do we need regulations as it were or do we self-regulate more i i think that we are still learning in this thing and sometimes we need to be mindful that we don't come with a heavy hammer of regulation so it's really about what is the best way to regulate or to sanitize the sector that works for everybody. There might be different regulatory instruments. Victoria, we talked about self-regulation, co-regulation yeah. in another conversation. But I think the, the whole idea is that we all need to sit down and really understand. And I think like John said, what are the threats that we're facing? Take a risk-based approach rather than trying to sort of kill a, kill, kill a cockroach or um, a fly with a sledgehammer or something or the other. But And it's a continuous process. It's not something that we're going to, there's, a, there's no magic bullet for this thing, but we all just continue need to engage and monitor. So we need an evidence-based system as well. Mm -hmm. what, what are the indicators that we're looking at? And I think Aiden mentioned they have data points at the sovereign level and then we build on that. How do we begin to, because even if we educate everybody and we don't know how to measure the impact of the education, we might not even be getting to the root cause of the problems in general. So a lot of analysis needs to be done, a lot of collaboration across the ecosystem, academia, business, government, civil society, and let's all come together and solve the problem for Nigeria using the lessons from other markets and frameworks for other from other markets and then we work with our OEMs as well and let them guide us in what we can do. Thank you. Thank you. Each of our speakers have mentioned make me excited. I wonder why but I do not work with the EFCC. Abba maybe we consider that since I'm excited about this. Um, but there are some questions in our um, chat box. There is one from Josephine Kolawole representing Emmanuel Asika. Um, Josephine says, I would like to ask if there is a long term projection on the part of the Nigerian government to match up with the growing rate of cyber technologies that get churned out on a daily basis. I think that question will go to um, Dr. Haru and then um, 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 maybe Abba could support um, Dr. Haru in responding to that. Um, actually, uh, 
on the part of Nigerian Communication Commissions, um, as uh, the Nigerian Communication Commission is currently uh, embarked on building a sectorial computer instrument response team. It's all for mm -hmm. this purpose. Also, the Nigerian Communication uh, has built a digital forensic laboratory to work in hands with uh, law enforcement agencies. It's all for dynamically uh, being ready to fight this type of crimes. Even recently, the Nigerian Communication Commission has uh, is going to install in the forensic lab additional uh, mobile forensic tools uh, capable of uh, um, actually investigating any type of uh, crime committed using mobile phones. All this is uh, to make the government ready uh, to be equal to this tax of high rise of uh, uh, cyber crimes in the cyberspace. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Abba, do you have something to add or do you connect to the next question? Okay, all I need to add is um, the effort that NIDA is it's doing as the regulator of the um, technological sector in Nigeria. Now, in terms of standardization of the technology to ensure that they are secure and meet the, youth, uh, meet, of Nida, uh, the meet the needs of Nigerians, the NIDA is supporting the development of these technologies and as well is regulating, regulating it to ensure that some of the cyber criminals do not take advantage of this technological development to understand to reap uh, other people of their heart and uh, income. And our part in the EFCC, we are working in collaboration with NIDA, NCC and other agencies to ensure that um, the, 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 um, the, the, the landscape is secure. We all know that no particular agency can fight this menace alone. So the importance of multi-stakeholder approach uh, yeah. cannot be emphasized. So as yeah. part of that, the EFCC, the, um, um, the CVN, all collaborate to ensure that we do our best to ensure that we support the development of uh, these cyber technologies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abba. Um, you obviously convey the sentiments of the um, um, panelists as well. Another question from Chair Makaibe says, um, social media plays a key role in a thriving digital economy. How can the government regulate this space effectively and for the benefit of the digital economy? It has been touched. It would be nice for um, one quick um, um, point from Aiden and then maybe Richard on the how. Um, how can the government? So this is sort of um, advisory. Okay, can I come in? Can I come um, in on this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, you can. Actually, over the top services at their call, such as WhatsApp, Instagram, Zoom, Twitter, um, have uh, had a proud and high sustainable impact on our national economy, evidencing the pervasive nature uh, of the digital economy. The Nigerian Communication Commission come up with a position paper where it it was recommended, uh, I mean, the paper where it was recommended that in a bid not to stifle the innovation, the commission should consult with the industry to renew guidelines and policies and develop an appropriate framework for provision and regulation of the over-the-top services in Nigeria. The paper further recommended that the NCC should also encourage network providers in Nigeria to innovate and explore more efficient business models that would enable them to compare favorably with over-the-top service providers. Network providers can also take advantage of the internet protocol technologies in the design of their network upgrades. Thank mm. you so much. Thank you so much, Doc. Thank you. Um, Aiden, any quick um, advice to the Nigerian government on balancing these two um, wide challenges? I think Dr. Caro has covered it very well. Uh, I think working with those vendors that are providing these platforms closely, making sure that the, you know, that the regular... Honorable Minister for Communication and Digital Economy and um, distinguished speakers and panelists, um, we believe that you can all agree with us that um, we have had very crucial and intelligent uh, conversations around protecting digital infrastructure and uh, encouraging innovation in the digital space in Nigeria. And our speakers and panelists 
have done justice uh, to the topics discussed today. Um, I think it's important to note that the federal government um, in the National Cybersecurity Policy and Strategy document has provided a framework to guide and foster economic growth. However, um, I think we all have a part to play to ensure that Nigeria and Nigerians are adequately protected in today's digital world and also to bridge the gap between countries in Africa and the rest of the world. So today's um, conference has been of great benefit and this kind of engagement is necessary um, in, in, in national discourse because it fosters collaboration in order to achieve common goals for national development. I am elated that this conference has brought together stakeholders from the government, um, the private sector, civil society and academia. And they've come together to discuss um, how to improve the existing frameworks. I'm also enthusiastic that today's conference would lead to deeper and more valuable engagement for our collective benefit. For example, major concerns around uh, data privacy and uh, protection can be countered by strengthening governance, um, legal and regulatory frameworks to improve international cooperation and uh, trust across the world. The successful hackathon that we ran also um, brought to mind uh, that we've got bright minds um, in Nigeria. It's an indication that uh, young Nigerians are capable of doing great things in the cybersecurity sector. And uh, congratulations to all the winners and participants. The cybersecurity industry is still in need of talent, and it is commercial's vision to introduce capacity building schemes to bring more talent into the industry. And this will reduce youth unemployment and bring more Nigerians into tech. We urge all key players present to invest in similar capacity building projects to develop the existing human capital. I'm confident that the engagement today has sparked a fire in us all to find innovative and sustainable ways to improve the digital economy in Nigeria. And I urge everyone present to go back to the drawing board for the advancement of Africa's digital capacity. Special thanks to the Honorable Minister of Communications and Digital Economy, Dr. Issa Pantami, the American Business Council for organizing this conference alongside Commercial Limited, and we also would like to thank our partners and sponsors, including the United States Trade and Development Agency, RAC Center, HP, uh, Cisco, Microsoft, AWS, Niger SecForce, and the Nigerian chapter of the International Information Security Certification Consortium. These organizations contributed greatly to making this conference possible. I also appreciate all our distinguished speakers and um, <clears throat> We thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and insights. I sincerely thank everyone present in today's uh, conference for attending. And on that note, I would like to bring the conference to an end. Thank you very much. <laughs>